Welcome to Be The Wellness Podcast, where we help you master your body, mind, and the experience of life through insightful conversation, interviews with experts and thought leaders, all with a side of marital banter and some good old-fashioned humor. Yes, we are your hosts, Adam and Vanessa Lambert, and we're committed to helping you live life fully expressed physically, mentally, and experientially. Sit back, grab a cup of coffee, and join the conversation. Podcast, Adam and Vanessa Lambert, podcasting from San Francisco. Yes, about San Diego. About San Diego. <laughs> well, more specifically about someone in San Diego. True, but we'll get to that soon. And yep. um, but it's been really fun being in San Francisco for a couple mm-hmm. of days. We scored a little pocket of magic here, which is the weather. And for folks who have ever traveled to San Francisco you know that it has a tendency to be foggy. Um, It can be pretty cold, especially during the winter. And we scored a week of beautiful, awesome, sunny weather. And it's, you know, February, and it was like 70, 72 degrees yesterday. Yeah, exactly. And it's been that way for like the three days or whatever that we've been here. Yeah. It's better weather than LA, which is not (laughs) typical. Not typical. So maybe the sunshine follows us. Maybe that might be that might be the case. And there's surf too, which has been yes, been banging. It is. It's too cold for us. But (laughs) we watch from the shore, going, "Oh man, that was a good one." Oh, (laughs) we're mind surfing. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) totally. I know. I was half tempted to like go to the rental shop yesterday and get a thicker wetsuit and a board and just be like, "Screw it, I'm going out." But we were on the beach. It was sunny. We we're playing with the dogs. I was yeah. just having a good time already. Yeah. 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 That's how it goes. Yep. That's how it goes. So we are so super excited about today's podcast guest because, you know, um, Brett Contreras came onto the set for us many, many moons ago. Mm-hmm. And I remember Katie, our BFF, Katie Cordoza, um, told me about this guy, Brett, who does glute training. And it was really like, at that time, we were pretty much mid-stride with CrossFit. Mm -hmm. So everything was about functional fitness. And really, you know, there was even quite a attitude about it. And we'll kind of get into that in this podcast about, you know, folks really almost the pendulum swinging from the body bodybuilding mentality to this real functional fitness type of mentality. Right. And there was almost kind of like a warring of the worlds, right? Like if you, and we'll talk about this even, you know, if you do, um, bicep curls, like you're lame or whatever, you know? And so it was really kind of this pendulum swing into the CrossFit world. And Brett is sort of an interesting dynamic because he sort of bridges the two worlds. He's not really fundamentally in the bodybuilding world. He really has a strong sports science background. So he's kind of, you know, I mean, obviously... Um, he's not, you know, camped in the CrossFit world, but he has an appreciation for it. And so he kind of straddles this line of worlds, really kind of being able to draw from the best of them and really also take his clients and what's important to them and really make that important to him as a trainer. And I think that that's really what I got from this podcast was that he is most concerned with what his clients want to accomplish yeah and i find that to be so refreshing no so for sure and that's sh- that's just kind of how it should be right you know and it's and it's funny that we even have to talk about that as like it, that being refreshing you know? <laughs> right. but it really is the it's it's just the case and I mean, we've talked about this a ton before where you know people start working with a trainer and this this tends to happen mostly with strength and conditioning but you do see this you know on the nutrition side as well and it's like you coaches get bored right coaching the same old stuff and right. so they want to try new things and get a little more complicated than they need to and then also clients get bored sure doing the same old thing and yeah. so it's always this balance of trying to stick to the fundamentals that actually work and then also keep things interesting enough for the coach and interesting enough for the client and you know I think he well we'll talk about it but yeah. in the podcast yeah. we'll get there it's, yes it's good so um, if you haven't yet heard of Brett Contreras, he is also known as the glute guy. He is the author 
of the Glute Lab mm-hmm. and folks that are in our community in any of our Build a Better Booty programs or any of that, you have seen his work and you have seen that as a reference in all of our materials when we are looking at any kind of glute work because yeah. he is literally the glute He's guy. He's the guy. He's yeah. the guy. Yeah. And obviously our best friend, uh, Glenn Cordoza co-wrote that book. And so we're really proud of them. We'll get into the book and really what a project that was. And, you know, it was no small task to get that that book into the world for mm-hmm. sure. Totally. Yeah. So anyway, he's also the founder of Booty by Brett. You can find everything out about him at brettcontreras.com or you can look at Glute Guy, put Glute Guy into any search engine in the world and he's going to come up. That's the guy. Yep. Yeah. And you're going to find lots of great information on him. So we are super excited to get to this podcast. Really quick, before we hop in, we want to remind you guys that there are a few spots left for New Zealand. Mm-hmm. That is coming right up and, you know, it's going to be an awesome experience. So yeah. If you're on the fence, the time is now. We just booked our flight, so we it's getting real, it's getting serious, and we are excited to go back out to yeah. the land before the time. Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. And so, fun fact, <laughs> yeah. Brett Contreras got his PhD in Auckland. He did, in yes. New Zealand. Yeah. Yes, that is a fun fact. That yeah. tied in well, didn't it? <laughs> it sure did. <laughs> so, looking forward to this podcast. We hope you guys enjoy it. It's a doozy. We um, really just had such a great conversation. It's almost two hours. So, sit back, relax, enjoy, and get a notepad. <laughs> Here's Brett Contreras. It would have been 2009. Katie and I are training at NorCal and like yeah. doing hip thrusts. And Rob Wolf comes in and he's like, what in the hell is going on over here? You know, and we're like, no, dude, this is like, what's up? And he's like, ah, you know, you guys should just be deadlifting. He's like, what, what are you guys warming up for? And we're like, oh, I mean, we're going to O-lift today, this you know? This is what's up. Yeah, he's like, this is how this shit goes, you know? And he's just like, oh boy, here we go. I've seen it all. Oh, that's funny. And here we are, you know, 11 years later and it's like, it's the thing to do. And you know, I, I, I remember that's why I got my PhD. I was curious about what I wanted to study, but also I wanted to be able to explain, like, because Rob would be like, why not just deadlift? Yeah. But it's different. Mm -hmm. How can I explain it? I didn't speak the right lingo. Mm. Like in my first articles and in my ebook, I would try to explain it, but I didn't speak biomechanics. Like I didn't know how to, and now I can just rattle it off, but it's just different. It's different for several reasons. And yeah. Now I now I'm, I went went through the process of the PhD not to become a research professor. I never wanted to go that route. I just wanted to understand science more. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. So I want to get into um, it, into a whole bunch of this and especially talk a little bit about the the science of strength and conditioning. You know, because our our audience gets. Um, we talk a lot about nutrition and, and a lot of this and the, the strength and conditioning and exercise component kind of just gets like thrown in as like, yeah, you need to do something, you know, and just kind of pick what it is. But I, so I want to dive into the science aspect of like the current state of where we're at with strength and conditioning. Um, but before we do that, let's, um, let's just kind of talk about how, like how you got started. I mean, you, before we started recording, you were talking about being a math teacher, like just give us kind of the, the play by play on what got you here. So, I mean, looking back, strength and conditioning was always my passion. I just didn't think you could make a good living off of it. But boy, have things changed. <laughs> yeah. Because back then, you know, as a, I mean, I, I look at my twin brother. He, his form is so bad, but he's great at teaching. <laughs> like, he's a good trainer. Right. And he's never made a dime off of his training. He's just like me. He always, we were always very social we had all these friends and it was like, Hey dude, come to the gym with me. We like talking. So yeah. the gym is a perfect time to have a, you know, workout buddy where you talk, talk about all things in your life. And so, and, and my brother was always good at like, he'd take the, the broken people who just got dumped or something and mm. I'm going to build you back up and empower you. And, and, uh, <clears throat> and so some people make for better teachers, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and I was always good at, like my friends, I remember I was at a party in, in college and someone goes, raise your hand if Contreras taught you how to lift weights. And all the hands went up, you know, it's, I, I taught them all how to lift. I taught my whole family how to lift. Yeah. This was well before I made money off of it. I, I would had, I always had a work. I remember when I was like 21, I thought, and I was thinking, I'm like, I've had like 32 different workout partners yeah. wow. at the age of 21. Wow. But I would take someone on for a few months, teach them everything I knew. And I wasn't particularly strong. I was just really good at 
you know, I, I, I geeked out on the program design element. And back then, there, there wasn't the internet. So right. all we had was the muscle mags. Right. And there was, there was, I mean, I'd go every, every single month, I would go to the gro gro grocery store or the library, yeah. and I'd read muscular development, flex, um, muscle and fitness, um, Ironman, you know, men's health. Right. Those were the main ones. Muscular development was my favorite. Yeah. But uh, it was all bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. You know, you didn't learn. There was a powerlifting magazine, too, that was discontinued. But I'd read that, too. But it didn't make so much sense to me because I didn't train at a powerlifting gym or with powerlifters. Those were scarce back then. Yeah. Now, now, you know, in this day and age, things are blended more. We incorporate elements of everything. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, that's all I knew was right. how the bodybuilders train and I'd buy the DVDs and stuff. So I accumulated a lot of knowledge. And then my, fr I remember one friend goes, how do you always know exactly what weight to put it on? Like <laughs> if I'm doing leg extensions or seated rows or yeah. whatever it is, even bench press or leg press, you know exactly what to put on to give me the perfect workout. And I think that's a, that's a component of being a good trainer. You Absolutely. just can like look at someone and be mm -hmm. like, I think I'm going to put it, I think I'm going to give them this. And yeah. then you just know, I've always had this sixth sense. There's an intuitiveness about it. Yeah. And so then, uh, you know, in college, I just loved learning. I love knowledge. In fact, that's what kind of sucks now about, I've realized it has benefited me very much with being the world's glute expert. Yeah. I carved out this niche and now there's dozens of glute experts like me right. and right, I right. was the OG you know yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> I was the original glute guy and now there's a lot of glute experts and I mean most of them there you look at their system it's just like mine right and it's because it works right they're not doing like just do squats right, you know right. like what the powerlifters are saying they're doing kind of what, what I recommend uh, everyone's a little bit different yeah but they're my my competition are seeing like I look at the before and after pictures and I'm like Oh wow! I gotta, <laughs> I gotta make sure I stay on top of my game because that's sure. what the people want. Yeah. Right. And you know, you tag that person, so they're not. You know, you can't just make it up. This person yeah. followed my program because they right. will reply in the comments and things like that. Like, sure. No, I didn't. Yeah. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's just it's like a different world. Like because I, a lot of my friends are researchers, right? And I'm so thankful and lucky to have them as colleagues. Mm. And I get to talk to them on the phone, I get to collaborate with them, but their world is academia, publishing papers and mm -hmm. things like that. And I just look at it like, some of the research coming out lately doesn't jibe well with what people are doing in the field. Like, so if some of these volume papers come out mm. and are saying, it's best to do five sets a week per muscle group. And I'm going, my girls are doing 40 sets. Right. All the best butts in the world are doing 40 sets a week. Right. So I, I'm not going to go, oh, guys, the research says this. We're switching to five sets a week. Yeah. And, you know, the research yeah. is saying this. So we're, we're just doing squats. No, that doesn't work. I know that. Like, yeah. I know that. Yeah, and I, I don't, yeah. I'm, the and it sucks because my, my, my colleagues are like, well, oh, so you think you're above the research? Yes. I'm like <laughs> light years ahead of the research. Like we need to study all this stuff we're doing. But yeah. that's not to say I can't learn from the research and I'm not open-minded because I always adapt and evolve. And I do pay attention to the research. It's just what I've realized now yeah. is some of the research is highly flawed. And so that, that could be a whole other podcast. I don't right. want to get into that. <laughs> right. Like a recent study came out. That'll be a whole separate podcast that yeah. would take an hour to get into. So right, we right. won't even go there. But, <laughs> um, but uh, it, it, back to what you were asking, how I got started out. Yeah. It was when I was, so I remember being like 24 years old. And that's when I first really, uh, you know, <laughs> I never had my own computer mm. and internet access and stuff like that. So here I'm 24, <clears throat> my first full-time teaching gig, and I have a prep period and a lunch period, and I have the internet at my disposal. Yeah. And I'm, I'm like, oh my God, I can actually like search, search for things and learn for free. <laughs> right. I don't have to pay anything. And there were these websites back then. I remember stumbling on like this website, Cyberpump, and, and Hard Gainer and stuff like that. Yeah. And I was like, these guys did one set to failure. And I'm like, what? Right. How could you see real results doing one set to failure? And then 
And then, you know, like, you know, T Nation, mm -hmm. uh, T Nation, you, you mentioned T Nation. Yeah. We all read it back in the day. Those yeah. were the best strength coaches. Uh, it's kind of gone downhill. Um, but th back in the day, that's where you learned from the yeah. best strength coaches in the world. And they were strength coaches and personal trainers, not bodybuilders saying right. that because bodybuilders all do body part splits, high volume. Mm -hmm. And I, I like that. I mean, especially like Delt Day. Who doesn't like right. Delt Day? <laughs> where you just do like four yeah. or five Delt exercises and have this huge Delt pump and yeah. look oh, amazing. I yeah, like yeah. Sometimes yeah. I go, that's my favorite. Yeah. That's my favorite. <laughs> sometimes I look in the mirror and I go, I would actually pay $1 million to just look like this permanently. Right. Yeah. The way I do after a Delt pump. And I go, why can't I just yeah. get my shoulders so big that they always look the way they are when they're pumped? Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, I, like, can't I do that? But no, I can't. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> but anyway, that, yeah. that, that's the way they, they all trained. And now right. I'm learning from people who train athletes, from people who train, you know, have personal training businesses. And they're not doing body part splits because they get someone three days a week and they're giving them three yeah. full body workouts. Mm -hmm. Right. And they're doing themselves lower upper splits. And I, I didn't know anything about all this stuff. So I was like a kid in a candy shop when I was a teacher. I remember I would, I loved it. I would lock my door you know, so I couldn't be bothered, get on the internet and, and, and sounds n naughty right now. I would read about, <laughs> yeah. I would read about strength yeah. and conditioning. Yeah, yeah. Just nerd I, out. Yeah, I couldn't get enough of it. Then I remember like girls that I dated back then and they'd be like, what are you always reading? Like at nighttime, <laughs> yeah. I studied. Right. And it's funny, me and my twin are similar. Like my twin brother is in a different field, but we just, I mean, he, he's like a, like a designer and like an architect type person. And he, He's self-taught, and I'm self-taught. Uh -huh. Everything I learned was through the internet, and it's such a cool thing. Like, you don't have to right. pay money. You can mm -hmm. yeah. become an expert on something for free if you're willing to put in the hours. And so, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, fast forward a few years later, I get my master's degree in curriculum and instruction, and this professor, and by the way, I can't find her. I can't find this. I want to reach out and find her and say, you changed my life. Mm. You changed my whole life. And there's like no record of her. <laughs> I need to go next time I'm in Phoenix. I need, right. It was at SCC. That's crazy. Scottsdale Community College. I was taking a course and, uh, no, sir, it was through, it was for ASU. It was at SCC. It was at, no, okay. It was through ASU because I was getting my master's degree through ASU, mm. but it was at, that's right. It was at Saguaro High School. They, they would let it, they would do it at the, they made it so easy for us teachers. Yeah. All the teachers would just meet at a local high school and they, they, they do it for the teachers. It was so oh, wow. easy. You'd go right after school for a couple hours and then you, you know, year and a half later you had your master's degree. And the teacher, what I learned was the teachers made the worst students ever. <laughs> like they'd be late. Everything was, well, my students. It's like, right, well, then right. don't go to, then don't get your master's degree. <laughs> and I have to grade papers and I'm doing this. And they were always complaining about things. And I'm like, God, teachers make the worst students. It's weird. <laughs> I remember standing up in the middle of a test and going, turn your cell phones off. We'd never allow this with our own students. Yeah. And the professor like goes, I'm turning my cell phone off. <laughs> um, but, uh. She basically said, we had to do a thematic unit. And she said, you could do it on whatever you want. And I thought, okay, since I'm a math teacher, I'll have to do it on math. And I raised my hand, can I do it on exercise science? She goes, you could do it on ice cream if you wanted. Yeah. So I just quit listening. I got out a piece of paper and started, I drew like exercise science in the middle and circled mm. it and then had all these arrows. And by the end of the period, I had like, the page was filled. It was completely filled with ideas. Mm. I mean, I, I think we had like three weeks to do the project and I, I worked on it every single day. So I turn it in. She calls me up on the phone. She says, Brett, like, what the hell? She goes, I've been a professor for 13 years and no one has ever turned in a project like yours. Like you went so far above and beyond. I mean, it's by like so much better than anyone, any project anyone's ever turned in. She's like, what are yeah. you doing? Mm -hmm. I have every, every, I have no doubt you're a great math teacher but life is short mm -hmm. and you can't waste it not yeah. pursuing your passion. Wow. Your passion is kinesiology and exercise science and you need to pursue that. Yeah. And wow. I couldn't stop thinking about that. Also, I was a, <laughs> when I was a, I had this teacher friend and we were so close, we were like inseparable and she, she comes in after school one day, she's like, will you go to this wedding with me? I have this guy that I like and I wanna make him jealous. <laughs> and she's like, oh yeah, just don't talk much. Have like a Russian accent. I'm like, what's wrong with <laughs> what's wrong with the way I talk? <laughs> but she's like, she's like, yeah, this is gonna be perfect. He's gonna be so jealous. 
And I'm like, your first escort job. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, don't worry, I'll make you look good. Yeah. She's like, you know what? You're come to think of it, you're like perfect. You're tall. You're handsome. You're funny. You're smart. You're witty. You're athletic. Your only flaw is that you don't make any money. Because <laughs> you're a Dagger, teacher. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know. You're like, so what do you think I stewed on for the next hour? Yeah. When she left, and I'm like, you know what? I. I, 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 I like I was still training people on the side back then and I hear what yeah. women say. I hear what people say. I could just picture like one of my clients being like, hey, I went on this date, this guy's so nice, so oh, he's such a sweetheart, or he's so this or he's mm -hmm. so that. Oh, you know, the only his only flaw is that he's a teacher and he only he only makes yeah. thirty five grand a year or something. I, yeah. I make way more than him. And you can say, Well then that girl's shallow. Yeah. But, yeah, but it's just, it yeah. still it's is real, a tough yeah. life. <laughs> totally, <laughs> making, totally, yeah. making. I mean, I yeah. was uh, my start off at twenty nine thousand a year, and I was making thirty six thousand a year, I think, when I left. And mm -hmm. so I was like, and I remember looking at the teachers, the salary schedule back then, and the most you could make in Scottsdale School District back then was fifty nine thousand dollars with a PhD and thirty years that experience. Is wow. so crazy. You wouldn't even come close yeah. to making six figures. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, okay, I can always teach. Right. Yeah. But I feel like I'm talented. I remember used to pace back and forth in my classroom. I'd be like, I know I have talent. Like, I, I'm unique. I have ideas. I have, like, I created a block course back then of, you know, it was like exercise science and weights. Mm. And we'd do lecture, and then we'd go lift weights. And I blended the yeah. two together. And it was, it was very successful. And I was a math teacher, but I made up that course, and it mm -hmm. was used, you know, the district used it. So I, anyway, when she said that to me, and... The wheels started turning. I thought, okay, I'll become a, I'll become a trainer. I'll open up a little studio, and I bet you all my male students will want to train with me, like all the football mm -hmm. players and stuff. And I bet you I'll carve out a little niche for me for making these, like stud football players, and yeah. and then the baseball and basketball players will want to come. But that'll probably be my main niche. I had saved up, like, you know, I, I had saved up uh, like twenty grand. And I, I think I spent like 15000 on my first order from, okay, so I bought a house, all right? I thought I needed to put like 20% down or mm -hmm. something, and I didn't realize my brother's a realtor back then, and he's like, no, you don't need any money down. <laughs> you can get 100% yeah. financing. Yeah. Like it's here in California, I've bought two houses, and you need 20% down, but in Phoenix at the time, you didn't need any money. So I had just saved up. 20 yeah. some grand on a teacher's salary and I That's find amazing. out yeah. I find out that I didn't need it. Right. So I was like, "Oh, wow. Okay, so I can use it for whatever I want." So I have never ever used my garage for actual as an actual garage. Yeah. So yeah. since I've had a house, my, you know, I think my first house was like 20 I was 28 years old and I that the first but like that's when like Fight Club was popular and stuff yeah. so I I wanted to like have a little Fight Club <laughs> garage gym in there so I made it was a giant wrestling mat that filled the whole I cut it to fit yeah. the whole garage and we had all the heavy bags and mitts and all the gear to do you know to, to do striking and grappling and everything and I love it. we would have a little fight I had like five friends and we do like fight training every week like twice a twice a week <laughs> <laughs> and we were doing jujitsu back then. I did yeah. jujitsu for like two years. Yeah. Uh, nothing like I never got amazing at it, but just enough to like defend submissions and yeah. stuff. And and it was so much fun. But then I'm like, ah, I want I want a little gym in here. So I used that money. I ordered it from Elite FTS because I remember I ordered all this. It took like nine months to get delivered. Oh, Back wow. then, <laughs> not yeah. like this day it was and age. probably out of like a catalog too. Yeah. 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 This day you order from Rogue and it's yeah, there the next yeah. week. Right, you know? right. Exactly. But I got the coolest equipment from Elite FTS. I got this amazing uh, power rack and platform with all the bells and whistles. Like every, you know, yeah. everything you can, every little, and every specialty bar and every, like the box squat attachments, the step up attachment, the... Uh, the monkey chin bar and right. dip, you know, like, uh, everything you could get with that. <clears throat> and this giant platform, it took up half of the garage, like a, yeah. the, uh, half of the garage. And then the, other, the rest, I still fit in there. I fit a <clears throat> um, competition bench press, a 45 degree hyper with a sumo base, a glute ham developer. Yeah. Um, I had a, a prowler <laughs> and I had my scorcher, which I had invented. That's when I thought right. of the hip thrust right at that s same time. Yeah, and uh, so I had a lot of uh, I, I packed a lot of stuff in there, and when I started anyway, when I started actually training people again, I thought it was gonna be all students, and I started training people out of my garage, and I thought, okay, 
don't be stupid and just start right off with a gym. Mm -hmm. yeah. Get people coming to your garage, right. you know? Yeah. I know you're not supposed to run a business out of your garage, but <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Who cares? Yeah. Yeah. Wait for somebody you, to yeah, right. wait until you make yeah. it. <laughs> so, so, um, and, uh, you know, I'm like, okay, it's going to be mostly like friends and family and stuff like that. Well, it was always the women that came in my family and, and right. my female friends would be like, oh, I want to train with you. And I'm like, they're like, how much is it? And I'm like, uh, 200 a month. If you come twice a week, 300 a month. If you come three times a week, it was like nothing. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah, charged yeah. like nothing. But all I did was I said, look, What's the rent going to be of a studio? Right. I want three grand. Once I can afford the rent, mm -hmm. I'll open up a studio. So yeah. I need ten people paying me three hundred a month, or yeah. fifteen paying me two hundred. Any any combination. Right. Of that. Well, I got you know I had like ten clients paying me three hundred a month, and I and I and these were like loyal clients right. who would come with me when I opened up my studio. And then I opened up a studio, called it Lifts. It was in Ganey Ranch in Scottsdale. It was this nice little area. And that's that, and it was booming. Like I, every day, I'd have like, because if I could go back, I would have called it like lifts personal training. But mm. I, the sign just said lifts, so people didn't know is this like breast augmentation? Or, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Oh, yeah. What yeah. <laughs> so, me out. Yeah. yeah. So it was called lifts, and I, I would, um, I would, uh, I, you know, I, I probably four times a day, people would open the door and be like, just people in the area walking by because it was an active plaza and they yeah. go what is this place and i go we're personal training check it out and then they look around i go take a flyer <clears throat> and then all my i remember one of my clients uh her name was leslie she referred 13 people oh to, to train with me <laughs> That's on, her, on her own That's amazing. Yeah. she was like a, a networker you yeah. Know? yeah and so you just so quickly i mean two, two different times i'd have people that would be training with me and they'd be like, hold on, hold on, I gotta go use my phone real quick. They'd go to the cubby, pull out their phone, and they'd be like, my, my daughter's on her way. Like, wow. what was the daughter would show up 10 minutes later like, as if she was just in workout gear, ra just waiting, ready for to the, go. <laughs> waiting for the call. <laughs> I'll be there in 10 minutes flat. So they'd show up and I'd train both of them and yeah. then they'd both join. And um, I got, I had, I remember my peak, I had 55 clients. Wow. And I remember bringing in, I think it was a $6,000 paycheck for myself. Mm -hmm. I had hired two trainers. And I was like, man, yeah. I'm going to be making like six figures very soon. Everything's going great. And that's right when the housing market collapsed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as a first time business owner, I had just invented my Scorcher. I had my gym lifts. People were asking me about franchising lifts. I thought in my head, because I invented the best glute exercise known yeah. to man. We didn't do barbell hip thrusts off a bench then. It was right. always off the scorcher. Mm -hmm. I, it's kind of funny. I didn't even yeah. think of doing it off a bench because you sunk your hips real deep. You had the, right. the back and the feet elevated mm -hmm. right. and you sunk way deep. And, you know, I, I never even thought you can just do this off a regular bench. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> you needed my machine. And I thought, I'm going to be a multimillionaire and I'm going to, you know, typical like first time inventor in a business owner. Right. You think, you, <laughs> you know, pie the in the sky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did it. Yeah. <laughs> and then the housing market collapsed. And I was so, uh, you know, I was bitter and resentful. And it was like, I did nothing wrong. Just a bunch of greedy banks and, mm. and uh, you know. And I watched all the movies about that whole yeah. housing market thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> totally. Like, man, yeah. how did they not see this coming? It was just greed of the, mm -hmm. of, of like the grand, scale. grandest scale. And mm -hmm. so, you know, most of the, you know, I remember reading the stats back then. Like, <clears throat> I think it was four out of five businesses fail in their first five years. Right. Um, and in, in that era, it was more than that, oh, obviously. Sure. Yeah. So my plaza went under. My investors with Scorcher lost all their money on land deals and they're like, we're pulling out. And I was like, what the hell do I do? Mm -hmm. What can I do? And I had a girlfriend then. She, I, w I had paid for her for a few years. And she's like, Brett, it's my turn to help you mm -hmm. and, you know, get, get back on your feet. Wow. Why don't you, you know, what do you want to do? I go, well, back then all my clients were saying, Brett, like... <clears throat> Why aren't you on, like, there's some guy named Chris something or other. He was, like, on News Channel 3. Mm. Each Every news station had their fitness expert. Yeah, Why aren't yeah. you one of the fitness experts? 
I'm like, I don't even know how you go about doing that. Like, <laughs> what do you do? I do call yeah. the news station. Hey, I know a lot about <laughs> I know some I stuff. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So much smarter than your, yeah, yeah, your yeah. current guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He probably doesn't even have a scorcher. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he doesn't even lift. He doesn't so, even know yeah. what a scorcher is. <laughs> so, so like, I don't even know how to, you know, that's a foreign world to me. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. how do these guys have time to like blog and do social media? Because back then... I, but being a, a trainer full time is exhausting. Yeah, you know, I I would train seven straight hours, mm. and that yeah. and that killed me. And yeah. I know people that train ten or twelve hours. Yeah. How do you do that? Day and day it's day not out? just physical; it's emotional. It's mental. You're so mental like involved shot. with your now, clients. Now yeah. I'm forty three years old. I train people like you know for three hours, mm. and I'm wiped out. Totally. Yeah. Even <laughs> totally. after this podcast, I'll be wiped out and I'll yeah. want a nap. Yeah, like, cause totally. Because I'm all animated. I'm like, <laughs> I like, give yeah. it. Because so you give it all. Well, that's what I realized. Yeah. Yeah. To do things well, yeah. you're you, you're exhausted afterwards. And what I realized is back then there were like two clients a day that got screwed. I'd be like <laughs> yeah. yawning and like low energy. And, <laughs> yeah. That's nice. Yeah, yeah your 6 p.m. So like, was you're, like, that's, uh, you're good. 6 p.m. was you're screwed. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> so like, you're like, let's stretch. <laughs> should probably foam roll for the next yeah. hour. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, you know, you're just counting reps. And, but anyway, so, so uh, I, you know, people would tell me like, Brett, we've trained with everyone in Arizona and you're the best. And, you know, you're, you, why aren't you out there? Why aren't you more popular? And back then, my clients were so, they were, they just were the biggest raving fans of mm-hmm. mine. They would do anything for me because I was unheard of, yeah. Yeah. you know? Yeah. And they, they knew I was like destined for something bigger and greater. And so then I thought, well, what a perfect time. I got nothing else to do. I should start blogging and being on social media, yeah. but I need to make money. Right. How can I make money? I'll write an ebook. So I spent like six months, or it might have been more. I did all these experiments. I wrote it all up. I, I, I made the ebook. And one thing that has been, I can look back at my career, and I never, I never feel like I really know what I'm doing. But I'm not afraid <laughs> to put myself out there. Like yeah. the ebook. I remember I wrote it. I, I designed it all myself in Microsoft Word, and then I just found. Back then, Word didn't convert to PDFs. Right. I had to find something <laughs> online that converted Word documents to PDFs, and then yeah. the file size was too big, so I had to go and like resize every picture and, <laughs> and like yeah. delete so many pictures, and then I, I could convert it to a PDF. And it's like, how do I? I need a blog. Back then, it was like, every one of us had like Brett Contreras dot WordPress dot com. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> dot org. <laughs> dot org. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you had your, that's right, dot org. And then you had your blog role. Yeah. yeah. Do you remember yeah. blog oh, roles? Yeah, yeah, for sure. You had like all yeah. your favorite people in the yeah. industry totally. that you had. <laughs> and um, I remember when I started making it onto people's, like Tony Gentilcore put me on his blog role. And I'm like, oh, yes. Yeah. I did it. I made it. You know, yeah. someone legit is vouching for me. Yeah. And, uh, and so, um, uh, you know, I, I designed my own WordPress uh, banner or whatever. Right. Like, have, have to, like using paint. I, I was a whiz with paint <laughs> yeah. before I started buying Macs. And why doesn't Mac have like a good paint? Like uh, paint was don't. amazing. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah, right. Was paint amazing. was so easy to yeah. use. You're right. Yeah. Like we were all like little mini graphics designers yeah. back then. But you're anyway, right. so uh, everything I did was like, and I can look back and laugh at like how poor the quality was. But I'm blogging. Mm-hmm. I'm YouTube. Yeah. Back in you, your YouTube videos was like. You had like your mom or your girlfriend or anyone who was around, like, hey, can you film this? <laughs> yeah. You you never edited it. You didn't know how to edit. Right. Yeah. You just did it all in one. Yeah. Like, one all my shot. first and it's funny, my first camera, I look back, I'm like, why didn't I buy a new camera? That was like you just didn't have the money. Like yeah. I didn't have money back then. Yeah. So yeah. I dropped my camera and it gave me a lisp, like the audio. <laughs> so it, I, I found it like this. Uh, yeah. And so, yes. yeah, the camera gave me a list. Like, my first two years I, of YouTube, like, it sounds like I have a list. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, that's, that's pretty funny. I'm going to have to go back and, and yeah. dig up some there, videos. I remember, like, there were people, people who would comment and they'd go, no wonder he's obsessed with butts. He's gay. This is his list. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. like, do all gay people have lists? Right, exactly. Right. <laughs> Seriously. So, I remember, yeah. like trying to defend myself. I don't really have a list, but it's the camera I dropped, and they'd be like, "Whatever, what, fucking gay, whatever, bro." Yeah. So, so I'm like, I so, uh, but I do my, uh, you know, you did it all yourself, and then I'm like, yeah. I want a podcast, and I had a, I had like a podcast, I had like four or five podcasts. They were really good because I learned was it Audacity. Yeah. I uh-huh. downloaded Audacity, yeah. and I learned because I'm not. I don't speak real quickly. I'm like slow and I pause and I say, um, 
but I could use Audacity, and I, it would take me like three hours, but I yeah, would right. take out all the dead air space in between yeah. words and stuff, and you do that, and I sound really smart. Oh, yeah, you just rattle. I just sound like I rattle everything off like this, and it's just Perfect. all on the tip of my yeah, I know. And so, and so my podcasts were really good, and then I, I, I got bored of it. I mean, there's a lot of work involved. That's oh, why yeah. I love so doing much. this with you guys. You do all the work. Yeah, yeah totally. I, pop on. Yeah, I'll put it out to my followers. Yep. They learn yeah. something. It helps you. It helps me. It, totally. And I don't have to. I spend you don't the, have to audacity. I spend the hour. Yeah. And, yeah, I don't have to audacity it or yeah. upload it or do all these things. So, yeah. But, uh, so that, and then well, I remember I wanted to do a, a research review. I wanted mm. to do, a, and me and my buddy Chris Beardsley were like, well, yeah. let's just make something. We had the crappiest logo, it was the ugliest, there were no graphics, it was just, <laughs> but people liked it. <laughs> and then we got better and yeah. better at it. You can always start something out and then improve upon it. Totally. People will always yeah. wait till they're, yeah. well, I they will say this. Well, as long as something. what you're doing is, is working and is good, then they'll deal with a you know, half-assed website. Well, I think we've yeah. seen a pendulum shift because it was, all these people who are afraid and it's like like mm. just do it yeah and now i feel like it's gone the other way yeah. where everyone yeah you're like wait no maybe you should wait a minute until <laughs> maybe, you actually I mean, I know yeah. all these people totally. you've never actually trained anyone yeah, yeah it's true you're giving workout advice you've never trained a single person yeah in yeah. your whole life yeah yeah like i waited 10 years of oh, yeah. well but i told you i have been training people since i was i mean i started lifting weights at 15 started training people at 60 now yeah you could say you're not a trainer or a workout partner but I, st I got but certified at 20, 21 yeah. or 20 yeah. or 21. And that's when I started taking on side clients and stuff like that. And, you know, I, I think I wrote my first article for Teen Asian when I was like 30 or 32 or something like yeah. that. Uh, it was 2009. So yeah. 11, yeah, I was 32. Yeah. I had had owned a gym. I had invented things. I had like <laughs> done a trained lot. probably, yeah. you know, maybe, you know, at least hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. Probably 500 people back then, you know. Mm -hmm. Now yeah. I've worked with so many more. But right. I had gained a lot of expertise as a lifter. I mean, the other thing, too, you got to try out all these different programs. you got to try, totally. you know, West Side. Try yeah. a powerlifting program. Try, you know, something like Smola or Shiko or the Russian squat program. Try out uh, uh, body part splits, different mm -hmm. body part splits. Try one set to failure. Remember I told you about yeah. the one set yeah. to yeah. failure? I oh, tried yeah. that and I, my body blew up from it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think yeah. I was overdoing it for right. so many years. Right. <clears throat> Not necessarily over, over training, but maybe yeah. I was overreaching mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I never gave myself, you know, and my body thrived off that because I had been doing yeah. high volume for training so for like eight straight years. Mm -hmm. I started doing the one set to failure and my body loved it. And there's now some research to indicate that you might mm -hmm. respond better to one or the other. Right. They just did a study was published and they had, <clears throat> it's this cool crossover design that this researcher Stu Phillips made popular. It was like, <clears throat> well, it was probably popular before him, but he started doing it with all his hypertrophy studies. Mm -hmm. One leg does one, you know, one oh, wow. method and the other, yeah. it's a unilateral <laughs> training, but it's mm -hmm. the, so it's a within subject crossover design yeah. where Every person serves as their own control. So mm -hmm. you can see like this person did with their left leg <clears throat> high volume and their right leg high intensity mm -hmm. or whatever, right. like, or high effort, whatever you'd call it. Yeah. And they saw better results with this one versus wow. this one. I love that. Yeah. And yeah. so <clears throat> anyway, um, and that's what I've learned as a trainer too. Some people, you know, uh, some of my yeah. clients, uh, I had to scale back the volume big time on them, mm -hmm. but they, or or you can let them do volume, but you gotta you could stop them way short of failure. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like one or the other. They can't do both. They can't right. do high frequency, high volume, yeah. high intensity. Uh, and I'm curious, like, what are, <laughs> but what are some things that you like? Some clues to differentiate that. Like you're like they oh. show up and they're weaker. Mm -hmm. So like I train yeah. them like my first glute squad. Okay, so let me. I'll, I'll I'll get to my first glute squad. So I so I so I all right. I have my own gym. I open it up. The gym fails. I write an ebook. I start. Uh, I actually write my first article, and there was a guy who was a blogger back then. His name was Mark Young, and he calls me up. I was at my friend Rob's house. Like we, he, we always watch UFC fights at uh -huh. his house, and and he calls me up. He's like from Canada, and I'm I'm like talking to him at my buddy's house. He's like, "You should start a blog," and I'm like, "Blog." Oh, <laughs> yeah. I always thought blogs for like I pictured like some nerd in a coffee shop. Yeah. But I'm like, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe I will. 
And then, so I just said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blog. I was like, God, I remember telling my friends, I'm going to blog. They're like, you're going to be a blogger? <laughs> it was like some nerdy <laughs> yeah, thing back yeah. then. Why does I have to have the name blog? Like, why yeah. can't it just be, I'm an article writer. Right. Yeah. I write author, articles. Yeah. 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 So, so I, and then I started using Facebook for actually like business purposes. Mm-hmm. And then I started Twitter and, uh, you know, my YouTube videos, I started doing that. And it was funny for so many years. Here's how it was. You filmed a YouTube video. You published that. You you embedded that into the blog. Mm-hmm. You wrote a blog. You yep. found a thumbnail, uh, <laughs> and then you posted the blog. And then you posted that to Facebook and Twitter and put out to your newsletter list. Yep. Mm-hmm. yep. And then, and you had your little pop up that that for to, for people to subscribe to your newsletter. Right. Yeah. And that's what I did for like eight years, and I blogged like four times a week. Mm-hmm. That was my life. Mm-hmm. And it was so devastating to me when. Facebook changed their algorithms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was my life for Mm -hmm. so long. And then Facebook changes their algorithms. And I'm like, what the hell's going on? Like, I I went from getting like, say, 2,000 likes and 500 shares to 500 likes and 30 shares. Yeah. This isn't even fun anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think you're supposed to pay, but I'm too proud. Mm -hmm. Also, I don't don't make the money. I don't... (laughs) It's funny because if I knew advertising and marketing, I feel like I could have figured that out. But I was like prided myself. I'm a scientist, not a marketer guy. Right, right. But I was so pissed because I'm like, I had power as a scientific writer. Mm -hmm. If someone like leave algorithms out of it and I go viral, my stuff, I have enough experience in this industry where when I feel passionate about something, usually other people do too. And it goes viral. And now you just made algorithms to prevent it, which I remember watching the movie like, what is it, social network or whatever? Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. uh-huh. And, and you know, like Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> was supposed to be all about, you know, like th- this is Freedom. A bigger, a, yeah. this is yeah. bigger than all that. This right. is bigger than all that. And then you go yeah. public and now it's just about the money. Yeah. Yep. And I was so mad. Total. And I'm like, why aren't other people mad? Do they not see, <laughs> like, do they not see what's going on here? And yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, but anyway, I had, I had when I, I, I mentioned, uh, so when I first started blogging, I had all these questions and people mm. would be like and I'd be like you know I had, I had clients that are like Brett I'm running faster because of the hip thrust I'm like well why is it because of the hip thrust well I don't know I feel my glutes yeah. kind of like working more on the ground like <laughs> when I hip thrust and I'm like huh so I started posting about that yeah but in all fairness like <clears throat> you know you always evolve as a scientist and as a human and you learn and mm-hmm. so I just thought this is obvious you know when you're your chance to influence your speed is on the ground where you can, you know, produce ground reaction forces. And so the glutes are very important for end range hip extension and you're going to produce greater horizontal force. That's the secret to running faster. And then the sprint coaches and the sprint biomechanists would be like, no, it's all about vertical force. I'm like, what? So like, if you wanted to go faster, you'd put a rocket underneath you, not behind you. Right, right. No, it's vertical. It's horizontal force. That's obvious. And there's been like, 50 studies now. Back then there were none. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or there were a couple, but I, we didn't know of them. And, and then, and then just the way things happen is funny. My, yeah. all of a sudden I'm, I'm like, I'm supposed to meet my friends out on like a Friday night and this article is published by this guy, Matt Brugelli and, and John Cronin. And it was like the effects of running velocity on uh, uh, kinematics and kinetics or something. And, and, and I opened it up and it was like, they had people sprint on a treadmill, mm-hmm. and they lo- looked at the vertical and horizontal forces, and it was 60% of max speed, se- or 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and 100. Yeah. And vertical force topped out at 50, 60%, but mm-hmm. horizontal kept going up linearly. Therefore, horizontal force is the secret to running faster. Now, it's more complicated that, than that, because that, now there's been a lot more studies. But when that was published, I was so happy, <laughs> yeah. because I'm like, all these sp- sprint guys were you know, ripping on me. There were like blogs that were like, glute guy needs to meet gravity guy and stuff like that. <laughs> and I was like, yes, finally. And I remember I emailed them and I think I was really unprofessional. I, was, I right. think I was like, fuck yeah. Like, <laughs> I've been waiting for this shit for ages. Yeah, yeah. I've been battling the sprint guys. It's obvious. Thanks guys. And, and, right. and I started emailing both authors separately. Matt Brugelli was the younger author. And then uh, he and I became good friends because he he got a job at AUT while I was getting mm-hmm. my PhD there, and then John Cronin, he became my supervisor. Mm-hmm. But it was weird because I was talking to Matt on the side, and Matt's like, "I was like, I really want my PhD, but here's the problem: yeah. here in the states, I have my master's degree in curriculum instruction and education. 
I don't have a master's. I can't get a PhD mm. until I get a master's, and I can't get a master's because I don't have the prerequisites. Yeah. I'd have to take like a year and a half of mm. undergraduate courses that I right. feel like are beneath me right, right. <laughs> yeah, to yeah. get into a master's program, to get into a PhD program. He's like, why don't you ask John? It's a little bit different in New Zealand. Like, mm. So I was like, I go back to John, and I'm like, hey, Matt said, you know, uh, and yeah. he's like, let's have a natter on Skype. I'm like, what the hell's a natter? So, <laughs> a conversation, <laughs> yeah, I guess. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this is the funniest story. I go to Skype with John Cronin, who ends up being my PhD supervisor. And we, we go to Skype and he's like, hey, Brett, I can't find you. Are you Devil Angel 666? <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm no. like, no, what? I'm... Brett Doug Contreras, he's like, that's not coming up. The only Brett Contreras I see is Devil Angel 666. Like, what would that make me, satanic? I'm like, yeah, yeah. oh, my God, I'm not going to get my PhD because there's some Brett Contreras out right. there. Working some other the Brett devil. Contreras yeah. that's satanic. So I like Skype. I think it was like 30 minutes before we were supposed to Skype, but I want to show him that I have this. This is my account was like yeah. Brett Doc yeah. Contreras on Skype. So I call him up. Not a devil worshiper. Not a devil So I call him up and we hit it off. He's such a easy going guy and I end up moving to New Zealand I lived with him in his basement for mm. like three or four months or something he had to like he had to get his his uh, his administrator assistant to be like Brett we're moving out today that's we're finding a place for you to live because I would have stayed in his basement forever yeah. where, so, where in New Zealand in Auckland uh, yeah. Nice. Yeah, nice. Nice. Awesome. and uh, nice and and it's funny because John and I had such a good relationship like he'd always make fun of me like we, we were we'd bicker like like he, 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 I was the only. So they flat, you know. A lot of the world they flat. Mm -hmm. like in the in the U.S., we don't even know what flatting means. Yeah. Like you, you basically rent a room out of someone's right. home, mm -hmm. or like the basement out of someone's home, and you live with them. We live with like a, a, a like a or married family. couple or so, yeah. a family or something. Uh, yeah. And so uh, I'm like, John, I'm not living. I'm not flatting with people. I'm like, I think I was like 30. What was I, like 36 at the time? Yeah. I'm like, I'm 36. I'm a grown-ass man. I'm not going to flat with people. I, I live alone. And he's like, well, it's so expensive. I'm like, then I'll, I'll yeah. make more money. He's like, how? I'm like, because I wasn't making much money back then. I never cared about the money back then. Yeah. Um, I just blogged all the time, and I made money off the ebook, and you know, mm -hmm. I just didn't really care. So I'm like, I'll figure it out. I'll make more money. And then I remember I, I hated being cold or hot. I have like the narrowest. Like, uh, you live in the right place then. I know. Yeah. That's why we're in San Diego right now. Yeah. yeah. I have the, and I talked to you about maybe moving to Hawaii yeah. one day. So <laughs> I have the narrowest range. It gets a range. little hot there, but I think yeah. you'll be okay. Yeah. But like, I hate being cold. I hate yeah. winters. And I yeah. sit there and I go, why do like so many people live in these freezing cold environments? And I some people ask love it. I myself that all the time. I hate it. I hate wearing <laughs> yes. layers. Yeah. yeah. Like, even at my home. So it I, makes me sad. Yeah. So I, I remember in John. John's basement, two different nights. I was so cold, my teeth were chattering, I, my fingernails were blue, I was yeah. shaking violently, and I'm like, never again. Mm. Never, I never want to deal, like, I can't even sleep, I'm so cold. Yeah. And I'm like, never again do I ever want to deal with this. So I, I'm like, from here on out, I'm just being the temperature I want to be, and then w <laughs> in whatever it ends up costing me, who cares? Right. So yeah. it's right. like, if, yeah. so when I moved into this, this apartment, I bought a little heater and like an air conditioning unit, and John was so annoyed at me. He's like, you Americans are so wasteful. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wasteful? Why would I, why would I want to be? He's like, it's bad for the environment. And I'm like, yeah. you guys would invent the fire. The Kiwis inv would invent fire and not use it because they would fear, <laughs> fear that it's not good for the environment. <laughs> you guys are innovative. And yeah. we bicker back and forth like about like Kiwis versus Americans. But we deep down loved each other. So he, yeah. he's like, you need to produce, Brett. So I'm like, then get me a key, like a key to the, the, yeah. to the lab for overnight. Mm. He's like, we don't do that. I'm like, okay, then fine. Then I'll, I'll, I'll go during the day with the rest of the students and all I do is talk. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know me, John, that's all I do is talk. He's like, I'll see what I can do. So I was the only student that had like a key at night. I would work nights. Yeah. I'd work overnight and I was, so, I'd be alone. I was so productive. Mm -hmm. I would work like, I'd sleep four hours a day and yeah. work like 20 or probably, mm -hmm. probably work like 17 realistically. Yeah. I mean, I was like sickly, but I was learning so much about yeah. strength and conditioning. I was reading so many journal articles that paved the way. Then I wanted to move back home and, uh, you know, and, and still get my PhD. So John right. helped me. I moved back home, start up my, I moved into a, a, a condo in, in, on 24th Street in Camelback in Phoenix. Mm. It, it was where my dad lived. It has a rooftop pool and jacuzzi. And I thought, mm. how nice would that be? Yeah. So I'm living there and this, this, 
a uh, trainer friend of mine, her name was Kelly. She's like, Brett, will you train? I have like six bikini competitors. Will you train them? Mm. I'm like, uh, I don't have a gym. They're like, well, you could do a better job training their glutes than we could, even if you just had a few things that you're out of your condo. And I was like, she's right. <laughs> <laughs> she's right, because they don't know the exercise I know. Yeah. Uh-huh. So it's funny. We weren't allowed to have like equipment in the, like workout equipment. So, and they have cameras and everything all over oh, this right. place. So it, like... I knew that like the security guy guy was always out on at, like 1 a.m. He was always out and out like smoking outside yeah. for like an hour. So he took his break at 1 a.m. I knew that. So me and my stepbrother smuggled all this equipment up. <laughs> it was so stressful too. We got we got my lever squat stuck in the elevator. Oh, I'm like no. and it like leaves marks and stuff. Yeah. But I'm like God, like, I'm gonna get in so much trouble. But we smuggled. I had a lever squat machine and a glute harem developer in my bedroom. Yeah. In my and then in the, in the living room, I had like the bench and the, the like easy bar. We the easy bar and mm-hmm. plates for the for for hip thrusts. And I had like a heavy like heavy kettlebells, like the one hundred six pounder. And then I had yeah. to buy the two hundred three pounder when they got too strong at that. <laughs> yeah. And I had I and mean, they did like so they did like six. So I started training like six to eight bikini competitors every Monday and Thursday. That was the first glute squad. Wow. It was out of a condo. Wow. They did like six exercises. They saw amazing results. Mm. We'd start out doing hip thrusts, and they'd, they'd, okay, there'd be like six to eight of them, and they'd, I'd go in order. So how much are they resting in between sets? Yeah. Probably mm-hmm. six to eight minutes in yeah. between yeah. sets. Yeah. And they're doing like three sets of hip thrusts. So they're resting six to eight minutes, but they have to, they're on my couch waiting, and they have to keep standing <laughs> up because their glutes are burning so bad. Right, right. Because I'm making them go to failure. Yeah. yeah. So we do three sets of hip thrusts first. And I had like travertine tile. So if, mm. if, they, if, if, if their feet slipped or they came crashing down, yeah. then I'm cracking tile. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, and you can find these on YouTube, you know? Yeah. Like, <laughs> so I would, I would deadlift the bar up to them, put it on there. I had an Arex balance pad we used. Mm. So that would be on their, on their lap. Yeah. And then I, they'd come to the top and then I'd set the weight in their lap. And that's fine when they first started because I had a 45 pounder on each side. The easy bar is 15. So that's 105 pounds. They all yeah. started with 105. Right. But six months later, they're all using two, at least 225, and some of them are using 285, <laughs> yeah. you know? Wow. And yeah. for, like, for, for high reps, you know? Actually, yeah, I think, yeah, Sammy did 285 for 12, and I think she did 385 for, like, a few reps. So, wow, that's amazing. And that's before, this was, like, now everyone's doing, like, 405-pound hip thrusts. But back right. then, this was the first, you know, yeah. Sammy was the first one to really, she's the one who I talked about, though. I, so what you said, so now we're back to, yeah. I usually make, wake, make my way back. Yeah, you, you do. You wind yeah, it back. Yeah. Yeah. So now we're back to, you said, how do you know? Yeah. So I'm training these girls, and Sammy starts pulling away in strength. Mm-hmm. But I train on Monday and Thursday, and by Thursday, she's wiped out. Mm. Like, she's so much weaker than she is on Monday. So I'm like, huh, she's, she's not recovered. Mm-hmm. And I need to do less. So I scaled down. I need to do less. I gave her two sets. She sees good results, but she's still wiped out on Thursday. I gave her one set. So I start giving her... Anyway, the glute squad would do these exercises. They do hip thrusts. Then they do uh, lever squats, back extensions off my glute ham developer, mm-hmm. like he- dumbbell back extensions, yeah. kettlebell deadlifts, and band seated hip abductions. <laughs> and they'd sit in my bed. I didn't have like a... The, what's the bottom box thing? Spring but, or, I didn't have yeah. the box springs. I put my bed on like crates, like mm. <laughs> that I found in a grocery store. So it's just like a mattress on crates. And they, so you would just sit on the bed because it was low yeah. and do band seated hip abductions. It's so funny. I my dad, my dad was so mad at me. He's like, You're never going to get a girlfriend <laughs> living like this. And I'm like, Whatever, dad, they love this. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> who's not going to want to date me and have amazing glutes? So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so we. So uh, uh, they, they started they, just off six exercises. I didn't even change anything ever. Mm. It's like yeah. I just tried to get them really strong at those. Right. And I had, I had a few of the girls were, were, were deadlifting the 106-pound kettlebell for 50 reps. So wow. I, I went to the 203-pounder, you know. And they got so strong at hip thrust. They got so strong at everything. And they saw great results. And, hmm. and yeah. then that's when I moved to – so then – I moved to, but with Sammy, she was like the first, but I would give her one set of like five exercises yeah. twice a week. So she was doing 10 <laughs> sets a week. Wow. That's kind of the lowest. And then I have other 
clients who do, you know, a lot of mine do 40 ish. Right. Mm-hmm. But that's what is so, hard about being an online coach is you don't yeah. know these things. Right. When you train them in person, you can figure you can these things yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so something I've, you know, picked up from what you're saying is that, I mean, this is a simple, super simple program. And I think that this is something that, that when we certainly see it or people want something new and exciting and, oh man, I feel like I've been doing the same exercises. What, talk just a little bit about when it might be time to transition exercises or do you think people are over prescribing too many change ups? Yes, definitely. Like so, well, you know, it just such depends on the status of the lift. When you start out, you need a master body weight. Mm-hmm. I like to teach body weight box squats. So you go to consistent depth and, you know, you, you do the glute bridge first. And once you're good at that, you move to the hip thrust and eventually you're doing goblet squats and then you move to the barbell and, you know, you might start out doing rack pulls or RDLs and then progress to, you mm-hmm. know, a kettlebell deadlifts and then regular deadlifts. And, but basically you always need, uh, but it's so, cause on the one hand it's so simple, but on the other hand, it's yeah. so complex. Like <laughs> yeah. think about everything you've learned because yeah. every, hu- every human body is different. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> it's like, you could look at cars and be like, or like bicycles and be like, this is going to be better suit like this. This like mountain bike will be better suited for this. This right. dirt bike will be better suited for this. This cruiser will be better. Like you could kind of theorize, but you can, people right. aren't good at looking at a human body and being mm-hmm. like, this person, you know, like when you have the person with super long legs and a mm-hmm. short torso, mm-hmm. you know, they they need a lower bench for hip thrusts. Mm-hmm. They're they're going to lean a lot during their squats. So I give them high box squats, like to parallel. Mm-hmm. So they're just going to parallel, but they sit way back. And mm-hmm. if they can handle low bar, I like low bar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, but you, you always, you have these things like this works like 70% of the time, but 30% right. of the time it doesn't work and you go to this. Right. Yeah. Okay, that didn't work. Let me try, let me see if goblet squats with the heels elevated work well for you. Let mm-hmm. me try this. But you're going to find that you can do a squat pattern. Mm-hmm. You can do, a, there's going to be a few types of hip thrusts and bridges that you like. There's going to mm-hmm. be some hip hinging patterns that you like. De- not only deadlifts, but everyone can do back extensions and reverse right. hypers and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And so, and then there's going to be some single leg exercises you like a lot. Mm-hmm. And so, and there's going to be, you know, there's 30 good abduction movements. You're going to like five of them. Mm-hmm. And so you kind of <laughs> stick to those, <laughs> stick mostly to those, but you never want to veer. And this is something that's kind of, interesting because I have my online booty by Brett program. So I have this task of needing to deliver results, Mm -hmm. but also not boring them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what I've found is that they're getting stronger and stronger. It worked well to have tons of variations. Like one month we're doing, you know, eccentric, accentuated pause reps where you lower under a count of four seconds, pause for three and then come up for one or Mm -hmm. something. Or like we're doing, you know, here's a constant tension for sets of 20 or something, or like mm-hmm. knee banded, right. you know, pause reps or something. And then <clears throat> that's, that works out well with full body training. Mm-hmm. So if, if you do full body training three days a week, then one day you're doing heavy this. And uh, what I like is like during my well-rounded months, it's like this fits, this works out perfectly. You squat hard on Monday, you hip thrust hard on Wednesday, you deadlift hard on Friday, and then you do other stuff right. that complements those. Mm-hmm. So on like the deadlift day, you can do a single leg movement because mm-hmm. that builds a squat. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe during the squat day, you do a stiff leg, light, light stiff legs, because right. that builds the deadlift without beating you up too much or mm-hmm. something. You can do throw in Nordics for your hammies. You can throw in mm-hmm. different bridges or reverse hypers or kickbacks or abduction or whatever, you know. But you just have to keep it in check and not do too much so they can be recovered. Mm -hmm. Because three full body workouts a week is not easy. Yeah, Yeah. totally. Um, To do it justice. Right. Mm -hmm. And then with upper body, I'll throw in an upper body press, an upper body pull. And then um, I give them 10 minutes at the end to throw in stuff they like. Mm Because everyone has different muscles that That they're stoked on. Yeah. Yeah. Like, (laughs) you know, I want to do more delts or I want to train arms or I want to train this. All right. So what I'm really, the stronger you get, because I focus on two lifts, one, one lower body and one upper body mm-hmm. every, every four weeks. Mm. Now, the stronger you get, because the reason, and I, I thought of this because of the research. I was like, wow, the research is showing it's really easy to maintain strength. Mm-hmm. You just do, and I remember with my, my before it was booty by bread, it was strong by bread. I just did one set, one set of, it was mostly single, like single leg and dumbbells, but at the end of each 
at the end of the program, I'd have them do. Was basically, they did one hard set of squats a week, mm-hmm. one hard set of bench press, and one one hard set of deadlifts, and one hard set of hip thrusts. One set each, mm. but they were doing single leg hip thrusts. Mm-hmm. They were doing mm-hmm. deficit reverse lunges. They were doing single leg RDLs. They were doing dumbbell bench press. The ne- after those four weeks. I had them test their strength and they hadn't lost any strength. Hmm. So as long as you're doing similar movement patterns right. and then you hit the one really hard set. And yeah. this was a hard set at the afterwards, at the right. end when they were fatigued mm. right. and they didn't lose strength. Mm. Now, would the same be true for like the most advanced powerlifters in the world where it's like, right. no, maybe not. But what I'm realizing is that you, whatever lifts that you care about, we're all different, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know? Maybe maybe you like the trap bar deadlift. Mm-hmm. I like the sumo deadlift, and mm-hmm. you like the RDL. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> maybe I like maybe I just love barbell hip thrusts. Right, and you happen to like band hip thrusts, uh-huh. and you like landmine single leg hip thrusts. Mm-hmm. And maybe for the squat pattern, you know, I just like low bar back squats, and you like front squats, yeah. and you like goblet squats for higher reps or something. You know, it, but everyone's different. But say you write down. Six, like my favorite six lifts are back squats, hip thrusts, deadlifts, bench press, military press, chin ups. Mm. I don't have a row in there, doesn't mean I don't like rowing. It's that <laughs> rowing are, uh, I feel like <clears throat> you, you're always going to do rows, right? But you don't, they're not, they don't make for good, like strength Primary lifts, like lifts. one, one yeah. rep mat, like you get. <clears throat> You start going too heavy and you don't feel it as much yeah, and stuff like that. Shit so, gets weird. Yeah. yeah. And, but like, you don't have to obsess about your. I'd rather focus on the chin up or the pull down. Mm-hmm. I really like pull downs too. And mm-hmm. I think they, especially the heavier you get, you yeah. tend to like pull downs a lot. <laughs> yeah, but totally. uh, anyway, <laughs> I feel like you can do pull downs. Like, I like yeah. underhand grip pull downs. Mm-hmm. And it's like a chin up. Mm-hmm. Right. And, I, and mm-hmm. I find that if I'm hitting, if I'm doing deadlifts, if I'm doing supinated pull downs, hitting them hard, I can always do 10 chin-ups, and I weigh 245 pounds. Yeah. I could do 10 chin-ups without ever doing chin-ups. Right. But um, anyway, people do tend to change it up too often. So progressive uh-huh. overload is so, it's like the most critical topic in strength and conditioning, yeah. but the hardest to talk about, because to a beginner, they're like, I mean, you'll get emails or DMs like, so do I just add 10 pounds a week? Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. that's 520 pounds a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Go oh, for should it. I just do, well, yeah. <laughs> yes, you should, and you should let me I know. I hope you goes. can. Yeah. yeah. Should, you, uh, uh, should I just do one more rep a week? Well, that's right. 52 more reps in a year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Think about your chin-ups. What mm-hmm. could you do last year compared to now? Are you right. one rep above with chin-ups? How, how depressing is it to be like, yeah. if you can get one more rep on chin-ups per year, you know, <laughs> totally. like I can yeah. do 12 right now in 10 years, can I... Can I do 22? Yeah. I, it's chin ups. It's like, look, just pick a, a month here and there to specialize on them and crush mm-hmm. them. And then also try and lose weight because like, right. yeah, it's that's disproportional. Yeah. Like, <laughs> if I'll lose 10 pounds and my chin ups go through the roof, yeah, totally. same with Nordics. Yeah. I can lower myself all the way to the ground with when I'm lighter with Nordics. But yeah. body weight exercises favor the lighter person. But For anyway, sure. people tend to vary things too much and not stick to the staples. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I remember looking at like Ronnie Coleman's training back in the day, you know, I had his, before he has his DVD at a tape, I have a VHS tape of his first, his first, you know, video and he he had his staples Mm -hmm. and he stuck to him week in, week out. Now I'm sure he'd travel and go to their gym and try different things, but you have your core lifts that work well for you and you Mm -hmm. don't need to stray too much. But I like to say same, but different. Mm -hmm. My, my program is built around these movement patterns and it's, single and double leg versions of squats, deadlifts, hip thrusts, you know, some mm-hmm. abduction movements like reverse hypers and back, like hip hinging, and then upper body presses yeah. and pulls, like compound. And then you yeah. sprinkle in some lateral raises and stuff that you like, like it's interesting. face pulls and stuff. But mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting to me, though, because you just said what your favorite lifts were, and I was like, I actually don't think I've ever decided that. And it just it kind of prompted me to think that, like, yeah, we kind of we kind of think about strength and conditioning in a different way where like you want to be entertained by it in a way, right? Like you use it as a way to entertain yourself. Like give me something new, give me entertainment within this context. And it just made me realize like I think it would be really helpful to define what your favorite lifts are and to like be in relationship with them in a deeper way. And like that just triggered me to think like do you do you 
you know, kind of prompt your clients to do that. Like really think about what you love and what your movements are and like be in relationship with them, so to speak. So this is something that's, well, I've got this online, you know, I'm like, I have like 950,000 followers right now and mm -hmm. this big online presence, but it's like, and then I also have a gym here where I train people in real life. Yeah. The real life people, it's like, I can sit there. I know their bodies, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, almost as well as they do. And yeah. I'm like, mm -hmm. like my client, Dominique, you can't do squats and deads. You can do high box squats. You can do block pulls, but mm. she doesn't have the hip flexion mobility. Say with my client Massa, who, who ended up moving to Hawaii, you can't go deep on things. You can build huge glutes, but you keep trying to go deep. You hurt, you round, you yeah. butt wink too much mm -hmm. and you hurt your low back. Mm -hmm. And so we don't do them. And it's yeah. no bit, who cares? It's yeah. like, just do, <clears throat> you know, just do high box squats where maybe a little bit above parallel, sit back a lot and go to the same depth, you know, maybe do RDLs where you just go right below the kneecap. Yeah. And, um, and don't, don't make them your number one priorities, like mm -hmm. do them to do them, but focus on other lists like hip thrusts and things like that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, and it's like, <clears throat> same with my client, Amanda, she's such a good squatter. Unfortunately, we can't squat rough. She always ends up hurting her low back because she, it's her hip flexion mobility. She mm -hmm. can't do deads from the floor mm -hmm. and she has to do RDLs or block pulls or trap bar deadlifts where it's not so much of a factor, yeah. but you, you, you know, with your real clients, you can test their hip flexion mobility. You can right. see when they start to butt wink, you can, mm -hmm. and then you can, I have, I have, this is the, like the greatest facility in the world for figuring out your best hip thrust mm -hmm. situation. <laughs> Cause I've got this Smith machine, <clears throat> the Nautilus glute drive. Yeah. I've got my hip thruster, which is 14 inches. I've got all those glute benches back there, which are 12 inches. And then I have some 14 inch glute benches, but we can tweak with everything. Mm -hmm. You know, I also have a booty builder, a glute builder, a matrix glute trainer. I've got like every yeah. way you can hip thrust yeah. I have. <laughs> and so, and the Smith machine, which is an angled Smith machine. And it's like, mm -hmm. you're going to figure out a couple yeah. awesome well, ways that you love to hip thrust mm -hmm. yeah. here. Right. And so, yes, my real clients, my, my glute squad here. <clears throat> so there, there's been three glute squads. It's funny. So I told you about the original glute squad. Then there, then I moved to Phoenix well, from Scottsdale. I moved to Phoenix and bought a house and, um, <clears throat> and I had my four car garage gym in there. That's the only thing that I wanted in the house was a four car <laughs> garage gym. And my brother yeah. found me a house. It was actually a block away from him oh, that nice. had this four car garage gym. And that is funny. I was in men's health for like one of the top 20 gyms in America. Yeah. It was a four car garage, garage gym. Yeah. <laughs> that was the first glute lab, right. you know? Awesome. And I, that was my second glue <laughs> squad. And then now I have, you know, now I'm in San Diego and it's the, right. the, the first official like glute lab, yeah. but it's glute lab San Diego, but it's fun. I'll tell you something funny about glute squad. So I had my original glute squad and um, <clears throat> the one out of the condo. And then when I started in Phoenix, like most of my OG glute squad wouldn't come to the Phoenix one. Huh. It was like this, like, and they say, but whatever, bro, we're the glute squad, uh, not yeah, the yeah. new people. <laughs> now, now I'm finding that my, I've been here for two years in San Diego. Um, yeah. And my OG members don't want to come anymore. They're like, I don't even know who half these bitches are. <laughs> <laughs> we're the original, okay? It's like they get, they get like, they, Possessive. Want, they, get, yeah. they don't want, they want more of my time and yeah. who are these yeah. new people. Yeah. yeah. But I've enjoyed uh, the transition here of, uh, working with tons of bikini clients mm -hmm. and that was I learned a ton mm -hmm. and then now finding some girls that don't compete they're just mm -hmm. they just love lifting and getting yeah. strong and, yeah. I, and I, I love those like so now I've got a few girls um I've got like kind of my my I've got so many of them but right now Carly Carly is like my <laughs> she's the strongest female hip thruster in the world well her, her <laughs> Carly Petritus or Katie Sonier. They're both, they hip thrust around 700 pounds. Wow. Mm, wow. And I've hip thrust at 815, but right now 700 with really good form is pretty good for me. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think I could, That's crazy. I could hang with them on one rep maxes. I could probably beat them. But if we do sets of 10 or sets yeah. of 20, I can't, they, they'll do <laughs> wow. super sets with, they'll go, both of them could go like 495 for 10 Jeez. to 405 for 10 to 315 for 10 to 225 for 10 like i can't do that wow that's you know incredible. yeah it's incredible yeah. they're so strong and mm -hmm. and people will think like oh well there there's some trick or like 
they're you're not using good form. No, they're yeah. just they're like just women's, strong. Yeah. women's really glute strong. strength on hip thrust mm-hmm. is yeah. And I, and I think that bo- I think that's one of the reasons why some men don't like the hip thrust. It's like they see these women doing, and they'll yeah. think, oh, if that woman can do, yeah. For I mean, it's like I remember getting a tattoo, <laughs> and I'm like. <laughs> I mean, if, if like women can get a tattoo, and it's funny because then I studied pain tolerance because I always heard women have higher pain tolerances right. than men, but that's not true according to the research. Oh, I, really? It's not, it's like nebulous, but mm-hmm. I, I think like women, like care, like if men had to give babies, we'd like cry like, yeah, we, <laughs> 2% more. <laughs> women, women, women are like, th- that means so much to them, the childbirth, so men would like, Give me the epidural. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right yeah. Now, Shut it down. Yeah. A second of like discomfort with, yeah. but like I think that 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 miss that conception comes from childbirth. Mm-hmm. But we do have similar pain tones. But I was always thinking if like back when I was like 24, I'm like, well, if women can get tattoos, I can do it. I yeah. was, I, it hurt so bad. That's why I only have one tattoo. I have something like weird with my skin where it hurts so bad, but you yeah. could like punch me in the face 62 times and right. I wouldn't, I don't <laughs> yeah. get knocked out and I won't go down, but, yeah. but give me a tattoo and I cry like a little wuss. So, um, so, Gotta know, yeah, stay so I, but I was like cocky, like, well, I, I remember the first time I learned skiing, I'm like, like all these people learn skiing, it can't be that hard. And I sucked so bad at it. I, I never try it again. Water think, or snow? Snow. snow Water okay. skiing, I got up my first time ever trying. Nice. Yeah. But uh, anyway, I think people do men, men especially cocky yeah. men. They just think, oh, here's this woman doing three, four plates per side. I'm gonna start off with that. Mm-hmm. I can squat more than them. I can leg press more than them. I can deadlift more than them. I should hip thrust more than them. They don't realize that that woman started off with 95 pounds. Right. Yeah. And yeah. took took three years to get to right. 315. Right. So they start off with that. They can do it, but they're heaving and they don't feel much in their glutes. They're using everything else. They might yeah. not be locking out. They're hyperextending. Right. And then like, this doesn't even work that well. Mm. But if they took lighter weight, right. you know, if you did like knee banded, like super strict form with a pause at the top, you could do 135 for a set of 20 and they'd be crying. Be and done. they'd be like, their yeah. glutes would be burning so bad, they'd love it. Yeah. Mm. Well, they'd love it if they got over their egos. Right. You know? right. But, uh, so, so that actually brings up this. So it's something that's been talked about quite a bit, I feel like, in the last, I don't know, probably 10 years in strength and conditioning is this idea that our glutes need to be activated and that somehow the way that we've been training for all this time, our, uh, our glutes haven't been activated and there's something that we actively have to do because they're shut off and it's screwing with your gait and blah, blah, blah. Is there any truth to that or what's the, what's your take on glute activation? So I always like, right, as a, I feel like my greatest strength as a scientist is like, like I said earlier, when you have a study that's like, five sets a week is beneficial. You, you, mm-hmm. One yeah. set is all you need. You don't need three sets. I'm like, yeah. really? Every right. bodybuilder in the world is doing it wrong? Give me right, a break. Right. <laughs> I always have a good, <clears throat> my BS meter is through the roof because I've spent my life in a gym. Yeah, yeah. I, I like, mean, yeah, boots on the ground. Most of my yeah. life has been in the gym, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, and even here now, like, <clears throat> I, uh, some days I get here and I'll just spend like 11 hours here at the gym. It's just what yeah. I do. Mm-hmm. And it's my home away from home. It's sometimes it feels like it's more my home than my actual <laughs> home. So, so I have a good BS meter now. So I I always try to keep myself in check mm. when I believe something, and then I'm like, well, let me look at it from different angles. Like, <clears throat> so uh, the reason why I think there might be some truth to it, and then I'll go against it, okay? Because okay. <laughs> I have all these powerlifting friends, and they uh-huh. love it. They'll warm up, but these guys are like. You know, these are like when I trained in Tempe, Arizona at this powerlifting gym called Revolution Training Systems, these guys are like pushing the limits. Like, you know, half of them at age 40 have like knee replacements, hip replacements. Like they they get too strong for their bodies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're too strong for their joints and they they disintegrate. Like (laughs) they're so freaking strong. And these guys, these are guys pulling, they weigh 200 pounds pulling 750, you know? Yeah. It's like some of them, if like, if they weren't injured, they could pull four times body weight. Like mm-hmm. they're insane. Mm-hmm. And, and <laughs> if it, they weren't injured, yeah. <laughs> if that's the yeah. limiting yeah. factor is right. how can I get, my muscles could get stronger, but my, mm-hmm. my bones and my, not, well, my, my, my tendons, my ligaments, my, the, the yeah. joint capsules, they, <laughs> they can't, can't tolerate it. it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so <clears throat> they'll spend 45 minutes warming up. Mm. 
you know, they had a buffer in there. Like a, this was oh, like yeah. eight, six buffer. years ago, like a car buffer <laughs> mm-hmm. that they oh, like yeah. buff out their muscles. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. They, this was before the vibration guns and stuff came right. out. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and they would do all their little glute activation stuff. And a lot of them were like, Brett, you know, if I do like a couple sets of band uh, hip thrust, high rep band hip thrust before I squat, my hips mm-hmm. feel better. I don't get that hip pain. Mm-hmm. Or like they'll do their lateral band walks and their glute activation series and it just helps them feel better. In those cases, what am I going to say to them? Right. Actually, you're fine. That's not true. That's yeah. not, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, 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 totally. <laughs> yeah. You deadlift 750 but don't know what you're talking right, about. Right, right. So, uh, so in that sense, I think, it, it, but here's the deal. Um, there is some evidence to show that like in, in low-level activity, like everyday life, the glutes don't act, get activated that much when you climb stairs, when you mm-hmm. stand up from a chair, um, and there's, without boring anyone, it might be that the glutes need a little bit heavier or, or like a more explosive activity to really engage. Mm-hmm. Now, um, I think when you're sedentary, everything gets weak, totally. yeah. but here's the deal. When you just standing from a chair, your quad, you know, your quads activate to like, you know, 50 to 70% of maximum. Mm-hmm. Okay. And in fact, just doing a body weight standing up with good form is hard for people. That's why you see elderly, like they yeah. lean forward, shoot right. their hips up and turn, it, turn standing up into like a good morning. Yeah, yeah. Or they, they, <laughs> they lean on something and press up uh-huh. because a body weight squat is hard for people. Mm-hmm. And it, it uses a lot of quads, okay? Climbing, a, climbing steps, the quads, some muscles, think about how much you use the calves in everyday life, you know, right. mm-hmm. climbing things and stuff. And so some muscles get more activity than others. I and mean, that's not to say the glutes don't have, but like walking is a lot of elastic. You're just like, mm-hmm. you know, and so you don't, so maybe the glutes do sh- shut down a little more just through disuse than other muscles. But um, this, it just got, it got so carried away. And then we had good terminology for it. And this, this is like NASM, the whole NASM. I liked NASM at the time because it was like, Michael Clark was a physical therapist. He just, right. he like founded the new, the more recent, the OPT model and stuff, uh-huh. and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which I don't like, by the way. But anyway, um, uh, I think half the stuff you see dumb trainers, like not dumb trainers, that sounded really conceited. Um, <laughs> like you see people, they're, they've never squatted before and they're learning to squat mm-hmm. on a BOSU ball, you know, dome right. facing down. Mm-hmm. And you're like, what are the, why are they, if the squat's hard enough when you're a beginner, yeah. it's just mm-hmm. the body weight. Make, <laughs> learn body weight before you stand on a BOSU right. ball. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think it's because of o, the OPT model, like the, mm-hmm. the bottom pyramid is unstable right. training. Mm-hmm. I don't like that at all. Uh, I don't think you do need to do much of that with most people's goals yeah. being physique and strength related. Nevertheless, at the time, I think it was important for people to start thinking about this stuff, but it got so, it was like every strength coach actually wanted to be a physical therapist and then every physical therapist wanted to be a strength mm-hmm. coach. And we just envied the other so, skill set. Yeah. Yeah. And you had strength coaches switching to like these full on wimpy glute activation routines and they, they had the terminology now. It was like, when you sit, and think about how smart this sounds. Like, listen, when you sit, you are, your, your, your hip flexors are bent. You know, mm-hmm. your, sorry, your hips are bent, your hip flexors are shortened. You're gonna cause adaptive shortening yeah. of the muscles. <laughs> now that your hip flexors are shortened, they adaptively uh-huh. shortened, you are gonna, you know, through a process called reciprocal inhibition, you're shutting down the antagonistic muscles. Right. Now, your glutes won't even activate, okay? Now that your glutes don't activate, you're going to rely on the other hip extensors, the hamstrings and the adductors, and you're going to get synergistic dominance of those muscles. (laughs) So now you have gluteal amnesia, Uh (laughs) synergistic dominance, adaptive shortening, your hip flexors are perpetually tightened, your gait is messed up, you're just screwed for life. You Mm -hmm. know, and it's not Mm. be so dramatic here. There's a study that shows that... (laughs) People, I, I think this is such a funny study because it was like um, 56 days of bed rest, okay? Oof. Bed rest. Yeah. They didn't do their own hygiene or mm-hmm. anything. They never moved out of bed except to do a set of squats three times a week. One set of squats three times a week off of a, like a lying horizontal like leg press machine, right? Yeah. But they utilized progressive overload. Some muscles shrank, like the hamstrings, but the glutes grew. Mm. And I did, it was like 0.07 percent of the time their, of their glutes were activated. Meaning right. 99.93% of the time their glutes weren't activated. Mm. 
you don't need to be using them all day long for right. them to grow and function properly. People's problem isn't that they're sitting too much. Now, if you sit too much, you start feeling like junk. Mm -hmm. That's not good for performance. So I don't want to act like sitting is never problematic. If you sat in the same posture, like you start hurting. Like yeah. it starts just. Yeah, you got to move. You got to move around. You got to change postures, get up, stretch, walk, you, you know. But you shouldn't be like, oh my God, I, I'm sitting, so I'm screwing myself and my glutes won't go. I get so many DMs. There's no way my glutes can grow, Brad. I sit for eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can. In fact, my glutes, when I stopped personal training all day long, I was worried about that. I'm like, shoot, I'm going to be sitting all the time. Mm -hmm. My glutes are going to shrink. No, they grew because mm -hmm. I wasn't on my feet all day long. Oh, right. oh, yeah. I also think you use <laughs> mental energy. Every time someone's going for like a PR, my, me my brain is like, mm. come on, come. like, you know, when you like bowl and it's like off to one side and you like, yeah, lean, yeah, yeah. You like <laughs> lean to that side, hoping you can influence the ball. Yeah. That's what I do with my, my clients. Like when they're like, I'm like flexing the muscle. I'm like, I care so much. So <laughs> yeah. I'm drained. By the time I go to lift weights, I'm drained. Shot. Yeah. Yeah. I'm shot. I just did 14 PR sets that day. You know? yeah. so, um, so I think that, you know, you don't need to fear sitting. You need to lift weights progressively mm -hmm. and just change your posture, stand up, stretch. Don't, don't just stay in one posture. But it's, even if you sit for eight hours a day, you can, have a, you can function perfectly. You yeah. can have amazing glutes. You shouldn't fear it. Uh, yeah. Most of my clients warm up for seriously like two sets mm. they yeah. do it i love they, that there, there, there's so many women that i train they're flexible their mobility mm -hmm. is just fine yeah i give them a set of goblet squats or a set of like reverse lunges with body right. weight and then a set of goblet squats mm -hmm. and then they're ready to go, and then to they, go. but they don't just start off with like heavy they'll yeah they'll right. do hip thrusts with uh that those light bars back there weigh 15 pounds so 45 on each side is at 105 they start off with that then they add a plate they add a plate so they're doing like for warm ups, specific specific warm ups yeah. before they get to their heavy weight. Then you do hip thrusts first here. Mm -hmm. Those don't require as much warming up. Like you're mm -hmm. not. It's not like with squats or deadlifts, you know. Then after you do yeah. your hip thrusts, you're pretty warm. Yeah. Now you move on to the next exercise, and you're already warmed up. You don't need that much. Mm -hmm. So we we make a very efficient use of the hour they have here. Yeah. What What do you think though? Because a lot of the times I think about glute activation, I just think of it mostly as a moment to really like connect the mental to the physical, you know. And so it's like less about for me, anyways. It's less about like actually turning them on, but more about like focusing. Uh, like what am I? Yeah. Like what yeah. am I actually doing? And so I'm curious, like. With glute activation, like, do you think of it more as that? Like, that's really a better thing to almost think about is just, like, the mental game? Yeah, so there's a study that um, they had people do uh, – how bad would this suck? It was a week long where you did <laughs> – it was an isometric position. Picture getting on all fours, and you have a band around your knees, kind of like a fire hydrant, mm -hmm. but you do, like, abduction and extension and, mm -hmm. like, extra rotation yeah, all yeah. at the same time, and then you hold it there. Mm. And it's one hour a day, 20 minutes, three times a day. So you don't hold it for 20 straight minutes. Right. You hold yeah. it for as long as you can, then you rest. Right. But it's, like, basically yeah. 20 minutes of this, and, like, I guess you, like, alternate sides, and then you do that three times a day for seven days. And they showed increase, you know, cortical, like cortical motor pathway, like mm -hmm. the, the output and stuff. And the, the, basically the, uh, the regions of the brain responsible for activating the right. glutes were like lit up more, potentiated right. more, and then certain things that inhibit were less inhibited. So that's some evidence mm -hmm. of brain adaptations, which probably have a lot to do with this mind-muscle connection that bodybuilders have always talked about. And I remember when I first started lifting weights, I would stay in the bathroom and pose. I mm. remember I couldn't flex my lats at first. I was like, how yeah, do you do that? And then, do that? <laughs> then I threw enough posing in the mirror. I, I learned how to really activate my lats mm -hmm. yeah. and my biceps and all these muscles through just flexing in the mirror. Mm -hmm. I did that when I was 15. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I think I developed that mind. But I don't think I ever squeezed my glutes back then. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. didn't, you didn't care about those. You just cared about your pecs and right. biceps and yeah. lats and delts. Yeah, but, yeah, totally. But then... Now, I, I feel like I can feel my glutes with every movement. Right. And a lot of people are like, I don't feel my glutes with this. I could be, like, hanging from a cliff on one arm <laughs> yeah. and, like, with, like, you know, pterodactyls flying around me trying yeah. to, you know, and then they're like, squeeze your right glute cheek. And I could be, like, <laughs> <"Got it." laughs> done. Right, you know, right. I could be in playing Twister in any position. And they could be yeah. like, I want you to activate 
your yeah. left glute to 70% of MVIC and right. I could just nail it perfectly. <laughs> so uh, I think that's a goal mm -hmm. is to have glute activation, good glute control with every exercise. Mm -hmm. But then also it makes people self-conscious. It mm -hmm. delivers nocebo effects. Mm. Like at some point, if, you're glute, if you don't feel your glutes that much, who cares? Mm. Yeah. You know, think about the rest of your body. Are mm -hmm. you ever like... I just did a set of military press, and I don't. I don't think my delts fatigued that much. Like right. I felt that more in my. Like I don't know what fatigues first with military press. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know if I get strong at military, my delts will grow though. Mm -hmm. Right. But I don't ever be like my delts are burning. I don't ever rack the bar with military press and be like my delts are on fire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Never. Mm -hmm. You know. Maybe if I did a triple drop set. Right. You right. Know? <laughs> yeah. But. Uh, um, yeah. It's like you have different movements for different purposes, and hence right. we go back to full body training three days a week. I love having a heavier hip thrust day, mm -hmm. and on that day, just use good form and try to set a PR or something, mm -hmm. you know. Right. And mm -hmm. and then, if you feel your glutes, cool. If you don't, it's okay. You got mm -hmm. more opportunities to feel your. You don't have mm -hmm. to feel your glutes on every set of every right. exercise every day of the week. Mm -hmm. It's like. You know, later in that workout, you could do, if you like frog pumps, do that. If you like knee banded, body weight, glute bridges, do that. If you have, do something at the end of the workout where you do fill your glutes. Right. You know, the next session, you could do knee banded, pause rep, you know, hip thrusts. Everyone right. feels those. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> and, you know, like, but, but one day a week, try to get stronger. Because mm -hmm. I just sit there and look at this. Okay, I weigh 245 right now. I'm not the leanest. Uh, you have to be around 225 to be lean, okay? Mm -hmm to actually have like decent abs, okay? Mm -hmm. And when I get down to 225, I'm like 15% body fat and I look very athletic. Right now, I don't know, I'm probably like 18% or something like that or six, I don't know, whatever, but it depends on what I use to measure it. But I right. don't have, like if I took my shirt off right now, I don't have nice abs. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, <clears throat> but like I don't, I don't obsess about like, you know, it's like I know that if I could stay 245 and just... Every year I look a little bit better because I try to set PRs, okay? Mm -hmm. If I can get, you know, a little bit more, a few more reps with pull down, like, and I don't just care about one load. It's like, right. I know what I can do. Here's my pull down machine. I can do 200 pounds for 20 reps. Mm -hmm. I can pin a 25, that's the stack. I can pin a 25 pound plate on and do 225 for 12. I can pin a 45 pound plate on and do eight. Those are my current records. Yeah. I want to be a little bit stronger next year mm -hmm. at this time. You know, I have what, what I can do on bench press, what I can do on military press, what I can do. And I don't always do military. Like, it's hard to build your bench. Military yeah. is kind of like, where do you throw that in? Right, so it's right. like sometimes I focus on the military. Sometimes I focus on bench. I'm not always squatting and deadlifting. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, when I know what I can squat and deadlift, I'm close to being back to, like, most I've ever pulled is 620. That's tough because it's like I, I want to get 635 because that's uh, <laughs> six plates and a 25 yeah. per side. But I, every time I start getting close to there, I snap something up. So, right, right. But I still want to hit that. But anyway, it, it's like, but I know what I can hip thrust. And right now I have what I can hip thrust with the barbell, mm -hmm. what I can hip thrust on the Smith machine with different loads, what I can hip thrust on the Nautilus glute drive, and if I can bump them all up. So here's my thoughts on progressive overload and it's kind of has a funny sexual twist to it okay so <laughs> i have my six favorite lifts i already told you okay right. but think of your six favorite lifts that you haven't really given much thought to mm -hmm. all right they're all balls that you're juggling okay so i've got six balls that represent my back squat my conventional deadlift my hip thrust my bench press my military press and my chin up okay and i'm juggling them and it's hard to juggle six balls at a time but every time I get stronger, that ball gets a little bit bigger. Mm. Mm. So now I've got balls of different size and they're growing. And all of a sudden it gets to where it's so hard to juggle all six balls, mm. they're going to fall. You know, mm -hmm. you just, or you're just, that's all you can do. You're right. topped out. You mm -hmm. can't grow these balls anymore. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so it's better yet to just put four of them on this table right here. Mm. And this is maintenance mode. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put four balls on the table. And I'm just going to focus on two of them. When you're just juggling two balls, it's easy to grow them. So you, what, what you, then you rotate those balls. Mm -hmm. right. This ball gets big enough, you put it on maintenance mode and grab the other one. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it just becomes easier. You can always, okay, if I said, you guys need to, to increase your chin-ups this mm -hmm. month. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
you could do it, what would you have to do? Do them first in the workout and mm-hmm. do them three times a week or more, you know? Yeah. But it's so hard to go up in chin-ups when you're also trying to go up on everything else. Yeah, right. totally. So you focus on chin-ups and squats this month. Mm-hmm. But you can't just stop doing deadlifts. You have mm-hmm. to do deadlifts, but you do it later in the work. It's not your focus. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's like, how do you put everything on maintenance? When, and I've looked into periodization literature and all these books, and it's like, yeah. look, they all, uh, you know, all the periodization stuff talks about how to manipulate like volume and intensity. Right. They never talked about rotating exercises like right. this. I've never seen anyone talk about it. But I think it makes for the wisest plan. And it's also cool to figure out for yourself... Because I've had people that like, I don't have to squat as long as I'm doing step ups and mm-hmm. single leg stuff. My squat stays put right. yeah. without even squatting. Right. And as long as I, you know, my dead, some people have, some people need more specificity than others. Other people, you know, as long as you're hammering out squats, hip thrusts, 45 degree hypers, single leg work, they, they haven't deadlifted in a month and they go pull something right. similar to their, close to their one rep max. Other people yeah. are like, 40 pounds down and have to work their way back up. So it's very individualized, but I think you see the best results that way. Yeah. And so for those priorities, right? So you pick two movements to prioritize for a month or four weeks. Yeah. And then just rotate. And then everything else is um, essentially accessory work to some degree. Maybe go into single leg, give your spine a break, you know, and just do some. Well, that's what I do. I strategically alter the months. Ah. So it's like after you focus on deadlifts, it makes sense to have like a single leg focus Mm -hmm. because your back is going to be beat up a little bit, especially the fourth week when you go for a PR, Right, right. you set a PR (laughs) and like, you got to be careful the next week. Like Mm -hmm. you you can't keep going. You got to then say, okay, I'm going to back off. That's a perfect time to transition into to single legs. And and like, and so it's like, I try to fluctuate them in a very intelligent manner to where it's Mm -hmm. like, okay. And then I have also have one of the months is not a focus. It's just a well-rounded month, which I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, I've got my well-rounded months, my, my squat and, and like squat and, and chin up focus, deadlift and bench focus, hip thrust and military focus and, and uh, single leg and dumbbell focus. And I just, but it's just the way I do things, but it's such a unique, fun way to do things. But what you talked about earlier, you asked a question about, um, you alluded to like the psychological aspect. So in, in in program design, we consider biomechanics, we consider physiology. The physiology is how you manipulate the 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 the, the, the you know acute program design variables, mm. the volume and effort and rest times and tempo and all these things, right? Um, the biomechanics is like has a lot to do with like the lifts that you you know, like your structure and what lifts you're going to be best at and things Mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, whether you should squat to parallel or below. How deep you should squat, Mm -hmm. These which which assisted lifts are best for you. But what about the psychological aspect? That's what doesn't get talked about Mm -hmm. enough. Yeah, totally. You have to have buy-in. That's where I think I have a huge advantage. Mm -hmm. I'm the glute guy. (laughs) Mm -hmm. There's a study on, they gave people, they gave dudes placebos and said it was dianabol they said it was a steroid and they got steroid like gains Mm -hmm. from the placebo effect so i think that i can get better results when people are on my programs because Mm. you believe in me like you could have the same program from some you know unpopular person who doesn't have the fame and the look and Mm -hmm. you you, that you might not see any gains on it but you you believe you know i instill confidence in people like i've Mm -hmm. been doing this a long time so they do my program I'll tell you a funny story. This was in Phoenix Glute Lab. This woman, her name's Jennifer, she comes to me. She's like, I, I can't. She's like, I can't squat deep. And she had this coach who's a very popular online guy. And this coach doesn't believe that anything builds your glutes except deep squats. <sighs> Nothing builds your glutes. Hip thrusts are fake. Right. Deadlifts don't. It's just deep squats. And she can't squat deep, so he told her, I'm sorry, there's nothing you're going to be able to do to build your glutes. <laughs> so she's devastated. Okay, so she comes to me, and she's like, tells, tells me what this person says. And I'm like, that's ludicrous. There's so many good glute exercises. I, I have so many clients that built their glutes on hip thrusts alone or, so, like, whatever. Yeah. What about lunges? What about this? Like, l- lunges are a similar movement pattern, but they don't build glutes. It just right. has to be squats. It's so silly how yeah. some people are about yeah, squats. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, well, let's see, let's, let's, let's play with your form. Okay. 
she ends up having the best squat form out of all my clients. Mm. I mean, it looked like, you know, if you ever read Starting Strength with Mark yeah. Ripito, she had yeah, like, yeah. Mm-hmm. without even knowing that, she had like the exact starting strength form. Like even the, the false grit, like a, the whole everything, yeah. neutral wrist. Like <laughs> she looked exactly like that. Huh. And I'm like, oh my God. But he, she, the, the guy was an online guy. He never worked with her in person. Mm. never Skyped with her or anything. So she's already beaming because she's like, oh my God, I just needed some instruction. Mm -hmm. And then she says, you know, Brent, I haven't been able to do deadlifts or stiff legs in 10 years. I was a cheerleader. I did one of those jumps where you spread Mm -hmm. your legs and I landed and I, I, um, I strained my hamstring and I haven't been able for 10 years. And I'm like, man, it should have healed back by now. Right. Yeah. 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 (laughs) So I said, okay, well, I made up an exercise. Okay. I thought, I like Nordic ham curls, but Nordics, you don't go into a full stretch right. unless you're flexed. So mm-hmm. I'm like, how can I? I'm like, okay, I want you to bend over this glute ham developer, the rounded pad. Mm-hmm. Fold your body over it so you're in hip flexion. Then I'm going to take your leg. You get it in full knee flexion, and I'm going to push against you. You're going to resist me eccentrically. Mm. And I'm just so it's an eccentric from a shortened yeah. position all the way to a full stretch. And I, I was like in a good position where I could provide just the right amount of tension. And I think we did two sets of like four reps, okay, mm-hmm. um, for both legs. Mm-hmm. And she was sore for nine days from that. Wow. She just hasn't activated her hamstrings yeah, in so yeah, long. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I think my whole rationale for that was I want to show her, I want her hamstrings to feel... I don't want her sore for nine days, but I wanted them to her to realize I can activate these again. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So then the next week she was still sore, but I said, let's do it again. So we did it again. So then this is like, okay, this is like, I like gave it to her on like a Monday and then like the next Monday and then now it's a Thursday. So it's 10 days later. I've given her this intervention twice. Mm. And she's like, Brett, I think I'm fixed. Mm. I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> I think it's good. I don't feel that I don't feel that feeling anymore. Yeah. I want a deadlift. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're like, we're doing good. I'm I'm out of your hip thrust, you're squatting. Let's wait. Let's just be yeah. patient. She's like, she's like, Brent, I haven't fucking deadlifted in 10 years. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna deadlift. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so she pulls 155 for a double. Huh. Then she grabs the 50 pound dumbbells and does a stiff leg for 10 reps. Wow. And she's just like, oh my God, you, you're magic. What did you do? Yeah. Well, if, if this had been early, earlier in my career, all I knew was biomechanics and mm-hmm. structure and posture. And, you know, so if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Yeah. I would have tried to explain it like she had some adhesions, she had scar tissue mm-hmm. built up, she had her fascia was disorganized whatever mm-hmm. i would have tried to say something like and i probably would have written a t nation article like the yeah, secret yeah. Ham, <laughs> hamstring healer yeah yeah <laughs> like, you do this special exercise i created and you're gonna you know you, hamstring strains heal in 10 days yeah right? yeah <laughs> and so, but i had been really studying the pain science at that point mm-hmm. in time and i i explained to her i'm like you had healed up the tissue had healed but your brain mm-hmm didn't heal or it held on to that and and it was like it you never got confidence back Mm -hmm. so all you needed was you know this guy with a large following with a phd who Mm -hmm. i have a good bedside manner or whatever like whatever this thing would be with like as a personal trainer Mm -hmm. i i make you feel comfortable i'm right there with you i'm i'm providing the resistance she's confident i'm Mm -hmm. talking to you my hands are on you Mm -hmm. like all those things safe. add to yeah. the, yeah. Mm-hmm. And you, uh, you regained your confidence. You removed the threat, the barrier, the, mm-hmm. you know, the, the inhibition to do this. And so now you, you know, you just needed that, yeah. that confidence. And so that's what, uh, so th- anyway, these are all psychological aspects. I can't tell you how many people they say like, I feel like you have fake weights here in Glute Lab. I always set PRs <laughs> here, but I, it's the atmosphere. Yeah. You know, you're around all these strong women. You're around me. Right. It's, you know, you get pumped up. That's why probably West Side worked so well with yeah. Louie. Like, you, you're going to set a PR there. Like, you're yeah. scared of dying. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, Everybody's bleeding from their noses. Right. And like, you're like, okay, <laughs> right. we're doing this. So the, the psycholog- psychological aspect needs to be taken into consideration. And this is very important when you first start working with someone. If they've done 
body part splits and you're like, no, I don't do body part splits. I do, you're doing two full body workouts a week. Right. They're going to feel like they're not training enough. Mm -hmm. They're used to training six days a week. Meet them, not even in the middle, meet them 80% on their end. Mm -hmm. Right. And just switch a little bit and then say, okay, for this month, like why are we taking them from A to Z Mm -hmm. instead of A to B to C to D to E, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, if they like b- b- body part splits, I'll go, okay, what do you normally do? Okay, are you okay with, uh, how about this? How about having a, m- Monday is like quad and glutes, Wednesday will be hamstring and glutes, and then Friday will be just like pure glutes, like, <laughs> um, you know, more like hip thrusts and abduction moves, whereas Monday will be like more squats and lunges, and Wednesday mm-hmm. will be more like deadlifts and b- back extensions and stuff, and they're like, yeah, that works great, and then I'll throw in like upper body pressing on and Tuesday and upper body pulling on Wednesday and maybe Saturday have some like arms or some whatever delts or something. But yeah, that that works. They like that, mm-hmm. and I just don't overdo it. I don't give them too much, and they can do it. And that now they're sticking to the body part split, but they're now doing more glute stuff. More they're doing hip thrusts. They're doing abduction. They start seeing results after a couple months. If they're seeing results, they become your soldier yeah, yeah they like, do, whatever. do whatever yeah. they get. You yeah. get them. I always say you get them to the compliment phase. Yeah, where people at work are like. Oh, are you no, working out? Yeah. What are you doing? <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> I want that. what you're having. Like I, uh, uh, you know, family members, friends, colleagues. Yeah. Yeah. Then they're like, oh, and then they're like, the, they're like so motivated, and they'll do whatever you want. But yeah. you got to get them to that point. But don't, don't be so like I, I remember these people are like you, these functional trainers. Like no yeah. one comes and is like, I just want to be functional. <laughs> That's my number one goal is to be functional. I'm so not functional right now. And I just want to be functional. I don't want fake strength. I want real life transferable functional yeah. strength. <laughs> I want old man farmer strength. Yeah. So no one says that. In all my years, no one no, said that. I'm not saying people don't like it, but they tra- yeah. they come to you mostly for physique or mm-hmm. whatever. And then... And it's cool to get them strong, and I like getting them strong because then they they transition from training right. for like purely aesthetics to actually enjoying the the strength building aspect mm-hmm. of it. But you you, you they, these guys would be like this was like popular like eight years ago. People were like you'll never I'm a functional training studio. You'll never catch you'll never catch anyone in my gym. I'll drop dead before you ever catch anyone doing a curl in my mm-hmm. gym. Uh-huh. And like, think about curls. Like, they're probably one of the most, actually one of the most <laughs> yeah. functional, because yeah. how much, often are you carrying stuff? <laughs> totally. Like, if you, but how much of us do real world stuff anyway? Like, right. most of us sit on the couch, and if you ever do real world stuff, you have to move, like help someone move. Yeah. And you're using your biceps a lot. Yeah. Like, you're in an isometric curl, yeah. walking around like that. So, but anyway, uh, <laughs> curls probably are very functional, but... Yeah. Anyway, they'd be these same trainers would be like, Well, I, I make an exception, we'll do half kneeling kettlebell curls, right? Like single arm, <laughs> totally. Yeah. Like, as that's less functional <laughs> than doing a barbell curl. Yeah. I'm sorry, like, I yeah. did the EMG, measured EMG of a 135 pound barbell curl, yeah, like not only just biceps, but your front delts, your mm-hmm. whole upper back, your erectors, your traps, your everything's going on. Lit it's up. a heavy lift, and that, yeah. In general, if the lift makes you breathe like crazy, it's good. It's you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so like, uh, I just don't like when people, you, you say that to yourself, oh, I'm, I, you'll never catch me doing this in right. the gym. Then you don't care about your clients that much. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'll do, like, you know, if someone comes in here and, no, I wouldn't feel comfortable teaching certain things. Like, I'm not, I love certain Olymp- Olympic variations, but I'm not Olympic weightlifting coach. I'm not right. a strongman mm-hmm. coach. Mm-hmm. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not amazing at handstands. I'm right. not amazing at Turkish get-ups. I can, I'm not, you know, I, I can help people. Mm-hmm. In fact, I, I'm bored, so I'd be like, okay, let's get good at Turkish <laughs> get-ups. Here, I'm going to, I got YouTube pulled up. Uh, yep, let's yep. try I've it. I've described it in my books, you know. <laughs> Here's how it goes. Here yeah. we go, okay. <laughs> and I'd also like to see if I could, like, come up with a new way that I feels better than like uh, how they, the sequence yeah. that they do it. I'd be yeah. like, 
it would be cool for me to be like, we took out this part. It, think about it. It's useless. Yeah. You just do this instead and you're stronger. Yeah, right, now right. it's the American get up. Yeah, yeah. now it's the American get up. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I would think it would be fun for me. But like, I, I uh, anyway, I would never, I like all exercises. Yeah. I love Olympic weightlifting. Mm -hmm. I love strongman. I love CrossFit. I love powerlifting. I love training for sport. I like yeah. watching what the strength coaches do for all the different sports. I love bodybuilding. I love it all. And mm. why would you not want to learn all the tools? I like looking yeah. what physical therapists do. Like yeah. we should, we should borrow from all. And I feel like Mel Siff, he wrote the book, super training. He was mm -hmm. like that. Everything was yeah. science and these are all tools. And there's too much, um, too much stupid fighting in the industry. Totally. Mm -hmm. Lately totally. I've been get, getting blasted because of hip thrust. And I'm like, I invented an exercise and these dudes hate my guts. Yeah. They hate me. That's so strange. You are the smallest minded people mm -hmm. on the planet. Mm -hmm. The lowest, like, like you, you yeah. hate someone cause it's jealousy and you don't even recognize your own jealousy. Mm -hmm. Right. Why mm -hmm. would you hate an exercise? Right. Do I hate squats so much that I'm going to like flip the hell out? Yeah. Right. Do I hate deadlifts so much that I'm going on a crusade? Yeah. But yeah. there's, pe there's so many people out there that are on a crusade against hip thrusts. Mm -hmm. I wonder why, because it's the only exercise invented by a guy. And they'll say, I didn't invent it. Mm. Right. Okay, show me, and I'll go, okay, cool. Show me any picture before 2006 of anyone doing a barbell hip thrust. Yeah. Oh, well, it's out there. It doesn't mean it didn't exist. Okay, then <laughs> if no one ever talked about it, ever, wouldn't it go to the, the credit go to the person who first, yeah. like, my dad did this in the 1960s. Oh, my God, then do, do you have a picture? I want to show it to the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, no one took pictures back then. Yes, they did. I can show you <laughs> black and white pictures of every exercise there is. Yeah, yeah. You know, like like right. popular yeah. exercise. There's, yeah. po there's exercise of... People doing bench press off of crates before there were like actual oh, yeah. bench stations. And well, there's like the hand drawn York barbell yeah. books, like from way right. back. Yeah, show yeah. me a barbell hip thrust for right. if, they, if they existed <laughs> back then. And it's so silly; they don't understand that it's they're just completely fueled by jealousy. And now that's what I a big component of my life is just dealing with these jealous. Mm. Yeah. And if that didn't Detractors. exist, if that wasn't a human condition, mm -hmm. I could spread the popularity of hip thrust with much more efficiency. Yeah. You know? But yeah. I don't know. Actually, sometimes like uh, what what did they say? Bad press is still good press, right? <laughs> maybe maybe, yeah, but, maybe it brings more yeah. attention. It's, but there's something though that that happens. I mean, and this happens in the in the nutrition world. It probably it probably happens in all, all genres of right, life, you know, right. but the ones that I'm kind of most familiar with is like, everybody wants to poo poo whatever the new idea is like, oh, there's no way. Oh, that's just too good to be true. It's just back to the same old things, you know, and like in nutrition, it'd be, well, you just got to move more and, and eat less. And there's, there's nothing new to be learned here. You know, so there's like always this tendency for people to want to claim, no, 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 nothing new. You know, so you do have to defend it, right? Because you're like, no, man, this is actually working and it's, it's, this is a real thing. And you kind of do have to defend that until there's like, until it becomes the, there's nothing new thing. You know what I mean? It's, so it's yeah. funny. There's a quote by Arthur Schopenhauer and it says, all truth passes through three stages. Mm. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. Yeah. Third is it, it is accepted as self-evident. Mm. Right. And... <clears throat> Here's the problem. I thought we were at stage three. Yeah. <laughs> then something recently happened to make me realize we're yeah. back at one and two again. And it's yeah. so silly to me. Like, it's all these conspiracy theorists. They think that I've fooled a million people out there, all my followers, into thinking hip thrusts actually work. And they actually don't do anything. And they'll say they don't do anything. So you're, you feel this glute. Like, when I do hip thrusts, my glutes... I feel yeah. so much tension in the, like yeah. the most so tension I can sore? possibly produce. <laughs> yeah. I feel the burn like, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. the, the, and they do nothing. Yeah. They do nothing. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. you're so clueless about, mm -hmm. okay. So, so, so the, you know, yeah. you, you can't even argue with these people. They're conspiracy theories and they think I fooled everyone. And <laughs> you, you know, I realize me being like, I always want to be, you know, I want people to like me. Mm -hmm. I want my, my, Integrity matters to me. I want people to trust me and know that I, um, you know, but, you know, it, it, it can't happen when you get popular. Right. Like, mm, yeah. like the, the world forces you to become, okay, have you seen, like, okay, Greg Glassman with CrossFit. He has this yeah. reputation just going after everyone now right. and just suing everyone. Right. But in his defense, like, 
Yeah, everyone bashed CrossFit. Yeah. Everyone. And meanwhile, yeah. it's an awesome system that yeah. people enjoy. That they love. It's yeah, changed totally. lives of it's changed of lives of people, mm-hmm. millions of people. Probably. And yeah. and you have so many haters out there. And mm-hmm. and guess what? Most of the haters are men. Mm-hmm. Well, who got into strength and conditioning? Like well, like who goes into strength and conditioning? Like there's a certain maybe it's fifty percent of legit people who just love the field. And then it's yeah. like the other fifty percent are like bullies mm-hmm. or it makes them bullies <laughs> mm-hmm. they really like bullies and they realize they can be bigger bullies with if they lift right. weights or like they were they were they got strong and big and became bullies but mm-hmm. it's the most insecure industry known yeah, to man for sure the mm-hmm. most insecure people just looking to bash i can't post a before and after picture anymore without everyone mm-hmm. saying there's i have to delete 50 comments yeah. This is my guest that I put on here. I'm showcasing her gains and yeah. 50 people I have to block mm-hmm. because right. they go on and disrespect my person, say mm-hmm. it's fake. Mm-hmm. And I know this person. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I almost want to like, I've thought about like, like filming, uh, like going to this person. Um, like today I posted Brittany Perley. Mm-hmm. All right. I want to ultrasound on her glutes yeah. and like show like, look, we're, we're live or here's an MRI. Like yeah. we we're going to, here's this doctor. Not a fake butt. Now yeah. let me talk, let, let me show you these 50, like, uh, you know, I had to block these 50 comments, but they're, they're the most hateful, ugly people mm-hmm. ever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just ugly, ugly, hateful people. Yeah. And they, they, I mean, today someone's like the stuff they say about me. There's even Reddit threads about me now, apparently. Like, <laughs> I won't read them, but, like, what a yeah. scam artist I am. Right. And it's just a sad state of affairs. There's so many, so much ugliness and jealousy and strength and conditioning, and it just goes with the territory of getting popular. But yeah, look totally. at Greg Glassman became mm-hmm. very cynical because his system works well, and it's like its own sport. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do those same strength coaches who bash it, do they bash powerlifting? Right. Mm-hmm. Guess what? I told you about my experience with powerlifting. Yeah. They were all beat up. Yeah. They, they, I remember they were competing at three of my the friends from that, from that gym were competing at Dan Green's um, um, competition. And <laughs> they're like, I just hope my pec doesn't tear off the bone. Yeah. Like I've been babing it the last couple of weeks. I think I could hit a 455 <laughs> bench press, but my pec might tear off. And then the other's like, I feel the same way about my hamstring. Yeah. Like my deadlifts... They, I've been having to, you know, be very yeah. baby them the last few workouts, but like I, I think I might pull 800, but I'm worried about my hamstring. I, I hope right. I don't tear it. Right. They're at that stage where they're so strong. They're, they're at this meet hoping they don't tear a muscle off the bone. Yeah. And you're bashing CrossFit, and right. people are like, oh, you like high ramp Olympic lifts? You yeah. think those are safe? And I'm like, right. It's they're okay. Whatever the case is, go to a gym. I trained at a CrossFit gym. I didn't do CrossFit. I just did my own strength and conditioning, but I mm-hmm. love their facilities. Yeah. Especially for like walking so, lunges. You got all this open space. <laughs> yeah, you totally. barbell walking lunges. And, yeah. But I, I trained at a gym and I saw there's not injuries left and right like you think. Right. Mm-hmm. So whatever you say about it, yeah, they're doing kipping pull-ups. They're doing the GHD sit-ups. But they're not hurting themselves like people say. And right. they even yeah. did research on this, and it shows the injury risk is, you know, yeah. similar to, like, bodybuilding or, like, lower than some of the strength sports. And that doesn't yeah. deter these people. Their minds can't be changed. They have mm-hmm. such a crazy bias against CrossFit. Well, I think they just won a class action lawsuit, right? Yeah. CrossFit did, yeah. Yeah. For, for libel. Not a class action. Not class no, action. not class action. It was a... a straight-up s- lawsuit. Sl- for slander for or libel. slander or libel mm-hmm. or something like that, Yeah. Right? Yeah. But here's the thing. Well, I'm on the NSCA board of directors, so right. I don't think I can really talk. About, I don't know what I'm allowed to say. I have my yeah. opinions as a. Right. I well, have my opinions about, about, about that, it. but yeah. but uh, I feel like you know I can sympathize with Greg Glassman. Mm-hmm. I can sympathize. You look at Louis Simmons. Mm-hmm. You look at his documentary, West Side versus the World. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's because he's producing the greatest powerlifters, and then he's being bashed by everyone about his system. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's like, do you think he's going to change up his system based on like he's producing world class lifters? Yeah, it just keeps working. Yeah, and yeah. and so, he, but he, there's so much, so many of these people who have never trained West Side, but they're commenting on it, and they're like, you know, his system gets critiqued so much, and it's like you you start to. Th- feel like you're against the world. Mm-hmm. Right. And I am, for the first time, just this stuff that happened the last week, I'm starting to feel that way. Like, right. I can't win. 
I, yeah. I, it's jealousy over my large following, and I seriously feel like if I was short, fat, bald, and came out that I have erectile dysfunction, <laughs> then I'm no threat to any man <laughs> yeah, in yeah. the world. Yeah. Then they'd be like, oh, hip, oh, thrusts, hip thrusts are fine. Hip <laughs> thrusts are fine. No good to do. You, you should do it. <laughs> Yeah. I, I, I feel like it's just this jealousy thing and these guys yeah. can't handle it. They mm -hmm. cannot handle it. They're like, right. it does nothing. Oh, and then these girls are like, I feel it. And then it's crazy. They will say, like, I used to do squats all the time and my glutes never grew that much. And I started doing hip thrusts and my glutes grew, grew a lot. Right. And they don't say anything. They don't even acknowledge that. They won't change their mind. I could have a thread of 1,000 women saying, look at my results. Before I started doing hip thrusts, I was training just as hard, and then mm -hmm. I started doing hip thrusts. Look at my results. And it could show huge before mm -hmm. and after picture differences. It wouldn't change their mind one bit. They'd never yeah. actually listen to these women and go, huh, interesting, good to know. You can't change their mind. Right. Yeah. And they hate my guts. They think I'm a scammer and a fraud and a... <laughs> And this, they, yeah, the thing I'm hearing, though, that I think I hope resonates with people is that if your trainer, your coach or whoever you're working with is almost that, um, you know, has that like, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, they, there's no flexibility, yeah, you know, the yeah, that like, that's your first red flag. Like, you, what I'm hearing from you is that someone comes to you and you want to meet them where they are. You want to enroll them in their possibility. You want to like help them to see their potential so that you can help them bring out their, like their highest potential. Whereas what I'm hearing is that a lot of these people are like, you come to me and it's my way or no way. And it's like almost if there's anything people take away from this conversation is like, just listen to what your trainers are saying. And like, are they willing to meet you where you're at and discover with you your potential rather than like being this ultimist of like, this is how it is. And there's no other way it could possibly work. Well, that's what I try and do with my glute squat. It's funny. So I'll have, you know, <clears throat> 20 girls come at my five o'clock, 20 at my six o'clock. And like, it used to be when I first started glute squat here, I, I, it, I would just have a whole circuit planned, mm -hmm. okay? And they loved it. But that didn't yield the best results. Mm -hmm. And so I broke it into the 5 o'clock and the 6 o'clock, and I had the 5 o'clock do a more structured, but the 6 o'clock was more for the people who liked the circuit stuff. And then I'm like, they're not seeing the results at the 5 o'clock. So I made 6 o'clock just like the 5 o'clock, but they, they do their – so here's what we do with glute squat now. You do hip thrust first, all right, and you, you know, because look at all those benches that I have, mm -hmm. and you do like four or five hard sets, okay? And then after your hip thrust, you do a quad exercise. It's either a squat or a single leg squatting or, or a leg press or a hack squat, okay? Then you do a hamstring exercise. It's either a, a deadlift or a good morning or a 45-degree hyper or a reverse hyper variation or a Nordic cam curl, okay? Then you pick a... Uh, abduction movement could be seated it could be standing cable it could be you know something with the glute loops mm. and you do about four sets of each and you do that twice a week now for some of them i have them doing something close to booty by brett where they're like we want to we want to brett we really want to focus on our squat this month so i will i will write i will do it with them I make them come up with the program, mm. but I'm guiding them. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I said that. earlier, I can always be a teacher. Mm -hmm. I'm always going to be a teacher. Yeah. So I have them write down. I go, okay, what are we going to do? You guys want to go up on squats? So what do you think we'll do first each day? A squat. Okay, what do you want to do on day one? And then I'll get them. If they don't, if I don't like their answer, I'm like, do you think that's... Or then the, I'll mm -hmm. get them yeah. to arrive at mm -hmm. what, what yeah. to do. And then I program their squats and so I'll go look, pick them up or body lift. Chin-ups, Okay. Let's do this for chin-ups. And then, <clears throat> now, you guys do the rest. What, are, what else are you going to put in there? We need to do a, a deadlift. We need to do hip thrust. We need to do military press, bench press. Throw those in, and then I'll look it over. You guys talk about it, and then come back to me in 20 minutes, and I'll look it over. And then I look it over, and I'm like, this is great. I would have done this differently. I would have put this here. I would have done this instead of this. Mm -hmm. And then they're learning so much. Which, yeah, you yeah know? totally. And so totally. I, I want my clients. And so it's funny. I have the way I teach form, but you look at the way, you know, I have some clients that squat wide, some that don't, some their knees aren't quite out, out over their toes. Mm -hmm. Some people like, you know, sumo dead. Some people like conventional. Some people don't do deadlifts at all. Some people don't do hip thrusts at all. Or they like band hip thrusts. They don't do barbell. Mm -hmm. Some people, 
you know, only do lightweight hip thrusts and focus on the mind-muscle connection. They don't go for progressive overload. Everyone's different here, but my job is to help them get the best system for them and that they believe in. And then yeah. if I believe they'd benefit from something else, convince them to try it, but not to, again, not to like, I wouldn't have many clients if it was just right. like, this is the this system. This is the only system. This yeah. is the way you do it. If yeah. you can't handle it, get out of here. They all do different stuff. Yeah. They do different exercises. They do different. Some of the competitors, they come in, their coach tells them, I don't want you building any more quad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they don't do any of the squats or the stuff like that. They mm -hmm. do more posterior right. chain, which is fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And my job is to just help them. And I don't mind that they have other coaches. I just try to get them yeah. t as per their coach's instructions, yeah. here's what we can do. And that's why their coach doesn't mind. Yeah. And I'm not obsessed Sharing. with the credit either because it's yeah. like. So the. Um, and I'm glad you're talking about this because I think that Glute Lab, the book, does a really good job of laying out a framework for figuring this stuff out. You know, how are you going to take a smattering of this and a smattering of that and like the importance of, of prioritizing? And I think, frankly, I mean, to your credit, the, the section on periodization is probably like the most succinct and like applicable periodization thing that I've ever read. Like you can actually do this, you know, instead of just all this crazy up and down all over the map kind of stuff. So I think, you know, for the listeners and we recommend the book to, to everybody, you know, we use a, a quite a bit of glute training and stuff in preparation for long hikes and all of this, you know, for knee stability and all the stuff that's like awesome besides just the aesthetic piece. So we recommend everybody go get the book and take a read through that. Um, but I want to know like what's, what's next for you, I mean, we're coming up on a couple hours here. Yeah. So I want to make sure we're we're, we're yeah. being good with your time. So, what's what's next for you? What are you excited about in the in the future for Glute Lab and Brett? So, okay, thank you for that compliment, by the way, because that's. I mean, I wanted to. What What's so nice about the book is that you know I partnered up with Glenn Cordoza, and I, like I waited for him. Yeah, you know, he's the shit. I waited for him because he made Supple Leopard. Right. A, mm -hmm. Was a bestseller. Yeah. I know. Mm -hmm. yeah. And like he'll do. He he. He wasn't like most people would have been like, Brett, we're at 500 pages. Stop. <laughs> you know, we, we actually had to cut like 50 pages right. out. <laughs> like, right. we, we were at like 670 or something. And we had, had to do 606. So first we had to like condense everything and like make everything smaller. And like right. then, then we had to cut out so many pages. So uh, Glenn was okay with every, you know, anything I'd want to put in there. He'd be like, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. And I need someone like that. Cause I, f I have this like OCD about comprehensiveness, mm -hmm. comprehensivity, yeah. whatever. Yeah. 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 Whatever comprehensive it is. Comprehensive. Is, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so the comprehensive. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I need it to be at that time. This is what I know. Right. And what was so cool is we were editing the book up until a month before, you know, it was like September 17th was right. the release date. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I seriously think up until September, we were adding more stuff into it. Totally. That never happens with books. Yeah. Right. And that's because Glenn is good friends with Erish, Erish. The, yep. the, the owner of Victory Belt. Like if it weren't for that, yeah. it's mm -hmm. such a good book. I, like I am so proud of it. Mm -hmm. We spent two years of our lives on that. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's my magnum opus. So I would like to update it. And it's funny. It's like, I don't even, you know, yes, I want it to do well, but like, look at the ratings. It's like mm -hmm. all five star reviews on Amazon. People yeah. love it. And I'm so proud of it. I'm so glad that it's helping people. And I will, I want to update it every couple of years, you know, yeah. or mm -hmm. every few years at least. But you say, what's next for me? What I realize, okay, I never wanted to become inaccessible. Mm. I never wanted to be, I see a lot of people in strength, strength and conditioning. It's weird. They got these crazy egos. Mm -hmm. I saw it with all the guys when I was coming up. I'm like, they think they're like, I'd go to seminars. This is before anyone knew of me. And I'm like, yeah, they act like they're, I just, I can't stand. I look at them and I'd, I'd try and meet some of them and yeah. I, they'd blow me off or I I'd see some of the way some of them act and, and hear stories. And I'm like, why are they so conceited? Like you're still a personal trainer. Right. <laughs> If you were all that, you'd have your own chef and personal trainer and chauffeur. And <laughs> right, right. You'd have your own staff of 30 people working for you. Like, you're going, to, you're still the personal trainer. Like, you're not, I, I mean, I don't think anyone has a right to treat people like crap in right. life. But if, if that were to exist, it wouldn't be the personal trainer that deserves to treat everyone like crap. <laughs> it's weird. And it's happened to a lot, I won't name names, but it's happened to a lot of people in my industry. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed that. It's some of these people become bizarre as they age and some of the 
great influencers in strength and conditioning became weird as they got older, and <laughs> a lot of them become these curmudgeons and stuff. So yeah, I don't yeah. want that to happen. So I want to be like, so what can prevent that from happening? Well, you got to be working with people. You got to be, you know, a man of the people. And so I don't want to become inaccessible, but I still answer DMs every night. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it takes me four hours now, Mm. four hours a a night. And that's, you know, it gets harder and harder. It's like, you know, I'm I'm up to Mm 950,000. At what point do you just, I can't get to everyone. But uh, I, I... I don't, if I just answer all my DMs, go to the gym and lift weights, read a couple of journal articles, make an Instagram post, yeah. uh, that's a full day of work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so then add into it, I did a podcast, mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. called a colleague, I trained a couple extra people. Um, Ate some food. It, it, I, I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, um, I have, you know, I'm always, with my BC strength, I'm always making more products so I'm on the phone with them a lot like mm-hmm. my team and it's like you know here's this prototype we're working on did you try it out what what are some feedback you know judgment like business calls and what I have to make judgments about the direction of the company things like that that alone is hard to do yeah and it's like I've got five workers we work we work seven days a week because mm-hmm. <laughs> I I set the example. Mm-hmm. I pay them well, but I, I work my butt off. Mm-hmm. You know, I probably work an average of 10 hours a day, 365 days a year. And, uh, and they do too. And mm-hmm. so what, we're, what, what, what we were able to do with my company is like yeah. more than companies that have yeah. two, 300 workers. Mm-hmm. You know, like we, we, we crush it. And so what I don't want to do is take on stuff like that book. <laughs> Darn near killed me. Mm-hmm. It almost killed me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's so I don't, I'm trying to not take on extra projects. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to coast a little bit, but I can't coast because I still have to work all day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I can't, but if I take on new things and new projects, it's like, yes, I want to have a certification. Mm-hmm. I want to franchise Glute Lab. I want to certify Glute Lab, like have you know, a certification. Mm-hmm. I want to do more seminars. I have all these ideas. I have this list of blog posts. I want to get back to blogging. I miss it. <laughs> you know, yeah. I want to, uh, I have ideas for inventions. I have uh, uh, another book that Glenn and I want to write, mm. you know, um, but uh, just trying to not get in over my head and not take on too much because yeah. you, f- for a couple reasons. Number one, your innovation, your in- innovation is like, uh, directly proportional to your free time. Mm-hmm. It's like when you're so busy, you don't have any There's of those no good ideas. Yeah. It's like when you're, whenever I'd be, I remember I'd drive, before I moved to San Diego, I'd drive here a lot and visit. Yeah. And like whenever I'd drive from Phoenix to San Diego, I'd have all these ideas. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> it was the first time ever that I had some quiet time yeah, nothing where else I'm driving where nothing's distracting me. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you want to be innovative and come up with good ideas, you need to have some downtime. That's totally. where it comes. For sure. And just also, you know, <clears throat> I get too stressed. I'm irritable and I'm not <laughs> as fun. <laughs> I'm not as good of a coach. I'm not as good at anything. So yeah. you, you, you don't want to be too slammed. And so I've been working hard for a lot of years. I'm, I almost identify with it. Like mm-hmm. I'm proud of it. And mm-hmm. it's like, Why? cool you you outwork everyone and yeah. you make all this money and you're not as happy as everyone else because <laughs> i'm now feel guilty to watch netflix for t- an hour i watched yeah. this movie parasite last night oh yeah did you hear about it i heard about it i haven't seen it yeah, yeah my niece told me to watch it won yeah. all these awards it's a yeah. korean it has subtitles oh, right. I so that. i yeah. usually watch movies that i can like work i can be on instagram mm-hmm. or something or be yeah. doing something. I always want to multitask, but with, when there's subtitles, it's in a different right. language you have to read. Yeah. You can't be doing anything. Mm-hmm. But anyways, a really interesting movie. It was pretty good. Yeah. Um, I can see why. It was very unique. And I watched that, but it was like, I, I start feeling guilty. I'm like, oh, shoot. I hope I get to my other folder on Instagram. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, uh, I'm trying to learn how to, that balance, Especially as I get older, I'm 43 now. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. I feel like if I work hard the next six years, I could, I could coast in life, and then I could also start giving back to the community. Mm-hmm. And a lot of my, I could start. You know, I've helped my family a lot, but I could start right. helping out people like me. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, remember that guy as a teacher walking around going, "I hope I wish someone discovered me. I wish 
Mm. I know I have talent. I know I could make six figures, mm. six figures now, which is hilarious. But yeah. um, <laughs> um, that was my like that was like yeah. the goal. That was the goal. Yeah. Yeah. And now I feel I could make six figures if I died, and ten years from now I'd still be making six figures just <laughs> off my, off whatever I built. Residual things. Yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah. but it, it, it's really want to figure out ways to push the industry forward. And I feel like for that, we need good research and good studies, mm -hmm. but I don't like that. I, I got the PhD. I've been on, uh, on 50 studies. I've been a co-author on, one of the authors on 50 studies, but it's such a, the peer review process, it's such mm -hmm. a, it takes so much time. Mm -hmm. yeah. These researchers deserve a pat on the back. They write up sure. these studies, they, they conduct them, they write them up, they go through the peer reviewed process where you have these people hammer it and butcher it and they, they sometimes it's good in theory it should be they're helping make the paper better a lot of times they make it worse because they yeah. don't know the stuff like you do right. but they think they do because mm -hmm. they have dunning-kruger syndrome you know <laughs> and and then you work so hard you get it rejected because mm. first you know the the journal doesn't feel like it's good enough for their mm -hmm. journal then you you spend a year and you finally get it published somewhere and it's just such a, a long arduous process so I want to hire people to do it, mm -hmm. to do to carry out the research yeah. and have my own little lab. Yeah. yeah. And then I could then it's just like you're employing these people and you're mm -hmm. benefiting the world and maybe yeah. I can give out grants and mm -hmm. and yeah. fund research and stuff. That would incredible. be fun for That'd me. Be amazing. And I want to keep coming out with cool. Pro and one of the reasons I wanted to make products is because I don't have to mark it up like I'll. I'll you know, I'll look into something. I'm like, this thing costs five dollars to make, and people right. are, you know, people are selling it for fifty bucks. Yeah. Really, you're marking up times ten. Yeah, yeah. You're greedy. Mm. <laughs> I mark things up less than everyone. Right. You know, I pride myself on, I like making good products, but they're not. They don't have to be the best quality ever. It's like the the best Useful. for the the best yeah. for the price. You mm. know what I mean? Right. Mm -hmm. It's like. I just made made my own balance pad. Well, the Eric's I like more, mm. but it's like fifty or sixty bucks or something. Mm -hmm. I can sell. I thought I can't. I don't even. I'm so like I have my CEO run everything now. I don't even know what things cost, but I think <laughs> ours is like say it's thirty bucks. Okay, yeah. I remember what it's like when I was a teacher. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that thirty bucks mattered. Totally. Like every penny mattered when I was making thirty grand a year. Mm -hmm. yeah. and like. You know, it was like, I, I wouldn't spend 12 bucks a month on Netflix mm -hmm. back mm -hmm. then. Right. Like, I cared about 12 bucks a month. Mm. Yeah. Now I'm in a whole different mm -hmm. situation in life, but I will never forget that. I never want to, you know, I always want to offer mm. different, you know, things that are affordable for people and help yeah. out my, like, no, never forget your roots, you know yeah, what I mean? Because yeah, totally. I feel like, for me, it's the coolest feeling is that to know that, you know, let's say Instagram change their algorithms and yeah. uh, and like you know real estate dried up and mm -hmm. the, the the market crashed and you know yeah. how much do I really need I'm I can make a lot of money but if if, if I really needed to I could live in a studio mm -hmm. I like studios apartments yeah. I, I don't even mind yeah. I would could live in a studio my I don't go spending tons of money i don't go out to eat every day i could i i like working and i like reading yeah. and i like studying i i flew to tampa to visit my friend paravella his i spoke at his camp last week and um um on the flight home i read six journal articles like i have this folder that i get yeah. i get backed up and a, a yeah. good night for me is reading getting caught up <laughs> on my my journal articles i want to read and so when you're a when you love your your field mm -hmm. and you love reading and studying and you can occupy yourself that way, then you don't need so much money because you're yeah. you're having fun studying yeah. and working and learning. And so I don't I don't have to entertain myself by spending oh, all this money. My, yeah. my you don't have to fill the void. Yeah, you don't mm -hmm. have to fill the void. The mm -hmm. foods that I like are you know I I always joke I can live off protein shakes, cereal, <laughs> nuts, seeds. Uh, dried fruit and yogurt. Those are like my and eggs. Those are my yeah. staples. You know, that's like ninety percent of my in my food is that. Mm. The food I show on Instagram is deviates from that, but right, that's because right. it's it's the it's stuff that's worthy. fun, right? Yeah. It's Instagram worthy. But yeah. anyway, I, I still drive a ten thousand dollar truck. I could care less about it. My friend Paul always tells me to buy a Tesla, and I, I don't care about what car I drive. Right. I don't. Mm. Most of my clothes I order off Amazon. I don't yeah. care about that stuff so much. So it's a cool feeling to know I'm taken care of for life. I'm yeah. set. Yeah. I'm set for life. I worked my way up in this industry. 
And the next chapter in like maybe five years is going to be how can I give back and how can yeah. I help push the field forward. That'll be a good position to be in. But right now, I'm yeah. just the main thing. Don't take on more and make your life miserable. Like yeah. I always have this history of your life gets good. And the second it gets good, you screw it up. Double yeah, down. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> right. I feel that. I'm mm-hmm. familiar. I relate. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, That's awesome. it's so cool to finally meet you. You know, Katie and Glenn have talked about you for so long. And before we went live, I was saying that literally Katie has been following you since the beginning. And it's so cool. And they have so much respect for you and so much love. And I totally can feel what they talk about, like that you're just so family style and that you're humble and that you're just really about loving what you do and making a difference. And so thank you for your time and thank you for what you're doing. And thanks for letting me, letting us just like yeah. peek in and be a part of it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Mm-hmm. I, I love this stuff. Like I said, you do all the work and then I put out to my followers <laughs> mm. and yeah. they enjoy listening to it and they learn a thing or two. So it, it's mutually yeah. beneficial. So it's my pleasure. Yeah. Awesome. yeah, absolutely. So what's the best place for folks to find out more? So if you are listening to this and you don't, uh, you know, you can't remember my name, Brett Contreras. You could just type in the glute guy. The glute guy. In anywhere. Yeah. Like on Instagram, I come up. Yeah. On Google, my blog comes up. Um, I'm, I want to start blogging again, but that's where you can subscribe to the newsletter. I don't send out very often, but when I have like a new thing, I don't spam people. So, yeah. uh, and then mostly it's just my Instagram that I'm mm-hmm. really active now. I kind of quit Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. In theory, I'd love to be doing all of them, but right. how do you do them all justice? Right. It's like Instagram's yeah. hard enough. Yeah, totally. totally. And yeah. Instagram is kind of an amalgamation of all of them now, too. It's I know. Like, it's like they became Snapchat. They became, became everything. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. An all-encompassing <laughs> media outlet. The only time I ever post on Twitter is so I can screenshot it and put it on Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Awesome. awesome. Well, thanks, thanks again, Brett. man. We appreciate You're you. You're welcome. And that's all she wrote, folks. Or all... Brett and Glenn wrote. Yes. <laughs> for about, now, anyway. For now. Yeah, well, that's like, yeah, actually, that's, that's a good point. There's definitely some more stuff in the pipeline. You know, before we sign off, we want to remind you guys, if you have not left us a five-star review, mm-hmm. this is an awesome time to do so. We are going to read one of our recent reviews because we really appreciate it. We read every single one of them. You know, um, they're not easy to come by, you know, to mm-hmm. get somebody to actually stop what they're doing and really take the time to write their feelings, emotions, and, you know, express whatever they have around this podcast is a really big deal. So we want to thank those of you who've taken the time to do that. And I want to just quickly read one of our recent reviews because Rachel B70 really nailed it. And we just so appreciate this. So Adam and Vanessa Lambert are two people in the world who truly care about the physical health and emotional, mental well-being of others. And it shines through on this podcast and through their amazing Be The Wellness retreats. They have created amazing environments through the airwaves and in real life for you to embody your highest self. Aside from having a wealth of knowledge about physical health and interpersonal topics, their compassion, empathy, and care towards others is inspiring, uplifting, and motivating. I have no doubt you will find something within their life's work and on their podcast that will propel and encourage you to live a happier, healthier, more abundant existence. Wow. Damn. We should just use that as our bio. I know. <laughs> Seriously. That wow, is that's, actually. That is really nice. It that's is like, really it's nice. It's incredibly nice and very well written. Very well written. Yeah. I, yeah. And, you know, and that's that's honestly like you guys don't get it. You don't have to write something that, you know, long or profound right. or even perfect. But it really when we read these things, you know, we're going into five years of our podcast like it's a lot of work. We mm-hmm. pour our heart and souls into this show and to the guests that we bring on. And so when someone takes a moment to write something like that, it really, I mean, it means a lot to us. Yeah, 100%. So if you haven't Touched. done it yet, <laughs> scroll down into your iTunes feed about halfway. You'll see five little stars. Click the five stars and right under, you'll see write a review. You click that, pop a couple words in. And every time you hear us do this little bit on the podcast, you will have an emotional box checked. Yeah, it's true. It's true. <laughs> and won't that feel so good? Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that's, a good, that's a good point because we really do appreciate it. And we thank all of you who have done it. Yes. And so if you have done it, every time we say this, you get a little attaboy. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. That's, I never even thought about it that way. It's just like ongoing, positive 
affirmation that you're doing good in the world. That you checked a box. And I don't know about you guys, but I love a checked box. It's yeah. my favorite. Yeah, unless it's your inbox, in which yeah. case you just don't seem to care. <laughs> then I just ignore it. <laughs> but you know, it's funny because I do this. I do this with podcasts. Like I'm like, oh damn, I want to leave a review. And then when I hear them say it, I'm like, I did it. Yep, that's me. They're talking to me right now. They're talking to me and I already did it. <laughs> All right, guys, thanks for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Bye. Bye.